Yeah, I know, I'm just thinking mine. I've changed it once. Kia ora, good morning everybody. It's nine o'clock and we'll uh, reconvene the hearing and get underway. Um, for those of you who were not here yesterday or for those watching online, um, just to reiterate that two of the commissioners um, are, have contracted COVID and unwell. They are online and participating from their um, accommodation. Um, and so we'll come to that. Ms. Sweetman, also the Section 42A officer, also has COVID. She is also online and watching the, um, observing the hearing. Um, Ms. Day, who has been here, she's not here today. Ms. Barton, um, who is um, one of the, the, the council senior executive um, in the planning team, um, she is also online um, taking the place of Ms. Day. Um, again, she, she thought she might be here in person, but a close colleague has also contracted COVID, so she thought it was better that she participates um, out of the room. <clears throat> um, so we're going to continue um, this morning with hearing um, the submitters. Um, and in terms of efficiency, um, I've talked to um, uh, Ms. Tepania and um, Mr. Uh, Mark Brown, and um, they have passed on their questions that they have to, or particular questions they have to submitters to me, so I'll be asking it on their behalf. They will come in um, only when they have any particular questions that they don't think has been answered. So um, the hearing will be essentially run from here, but I'll defer to those two commissioners um, if we need to. Um, so on that basis, we'll simply get underway, and I've got a schedule in front of me, and I'll just call submitters um, in terms of the schedule I've got, and we'll continue on. Um, and again, uh, I just want to reiterate to all of the submitters, um, we've been hearing a lot of issues from submitters. A lot of the, um, as I'd say, there, there is a variation on a theme. It's very clear what submitters are asking. Um, so on that basis, there may not be um, a number of, there may not be lots of questions coming back from, from the commissioners. Really, we're only asking questions where we need clarification. So, um, so if you don't get a question, please don't take it as disinterest. It's simply that we understand the issues um, and <clears throat> what we're really looking for is to hear from you and to reiterate the concerns that you've got in your submissions. So on that basis, we'll just continue. So the first submitter I've got is Ms Hill, and I, I'm not sure if Ms Hill is here. We can, we'll probably need to be a bit flexible as you're coming, so she isn't here at this stage. Um, Ms Dooley, I'm, just, I'm not sure. That I'm, He's not here yet. Jonathan Holland. You'll know some of these submitters. So if anyone comes, I won't know. If anyone comes in, can you just alert Ms. Ms. Uh, McShay to say that a certain submitters come in? Um, Dr. Stellard. <coughs>
thank you. Um, Marina Koto, thank you for this time to speak. Mm -hmm. I'd like to um, acknowledge the applicants, all the work they've done, in particular Ngāti Kuata, Estangata Whenua, and other submitters. My name is Aaron Stallard. I'm an eighth generation Nelsonian. I have a PhD in geology and run a scientific editing, editing business in the city. I have three adult children and care very much about the city and the region. When I heard of plans to build 550 houses in the Maitai Valley, I knew I wanted to speak at this hearing because I value the peaceful open spaces close to the city. And I would like the commissioners to know of the, how the proposed development would negatively affect the people in this region. I also knew I wanted to take action because I didn't want to be remembered as the generation that stood by as urban sprawl occurred into the Maitai Valley. My family has enjoyed the tranquil rural setting of the Maitai for many generations. Here are my auntie and uncle at Black Hole in about 1965. And at the same spot, this is myself in the foreground and my cousins. You can see I haven't changed a bit. <laughs> so one of my earliest memories is of a large family picnic at Sunday Hole. Me and my sisters, my cousins, <clears throat> aunts and uncles, my grandparents relaxing, swimming and enjoying the open spaces, the bird song and the peace. Over the decades, the two decades since then, I've spent countless hours running the trails in the valley, cycling, going for walks with friends and family, valuing the chance to escape the city and the bustle, to clear my head and relax to be mindful and enjoy nature. The rural qualities of the valley give us the feeling of taking refuge from the stresses of life as though time is slowing down, offering us the chance to rest and recover and simply be. That is why we go there. We could access the river in the city, but the river is less healthy in urban areas and the setting is developed and cramped with traffic and noise. It would be a great loss if this were to happen in the lower Maitai Valley. I would argue that greenfield developments and urban sprawl are ideas of the past and are not part of today's solutions. Today the emphasis is on a compact urban form, a clear urban rural boundary, a mode shift to active transport, intensification and protecting remaining green spaces that as we heard yesterday become only more valuable as population pressure increases. It's time to look forward, not backward, and to fundamentally change the way we do things for the better, to recognise that we must set limits in order to protect the things we value. It seems to me that Council's plans and strategies place an emphasis on protecting green space rather than promoting 1970s style urban sprawl. I do wonder how the proposed subdivision can be consistent with all those plans and strategies. To my mind, this approach to accommodating growth represents a failure of imagination and effort. It's akin to suggesting that traffic congestion can be solved by building more roads, when in fact the opposite is true. We must get people out of cars. By taking such business as usual approaches, we are kicking the can down the road at great cost to future generations. One thing we can be sure of is that if this subdivision goes ahead, it will set back efforts towards intensification by a decade or more. And remember, this is the decade in which we must reduce emissions by 50% to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. We are now a quarter of the way through this decade with no discernible progress in reducing emissions. This is not the time for business as usual decisions. I'm aware that councils are under pressure from central government to identify housing capacity, but we know that we cannot achieve endless growth on a finite planet. And if we apply this principle locally, surely it's unrealistic to require a geographically constrained city such as Nelson, with ocean to the west, mountains to the east, and existing urban areas north and south, to make provi provisions for endless growth. I would argue that the community should be allowed to protect highly valued recreation areas and that we should endeavour to meet as much housing demand as possible via intensification. In my view, the proposal by the applicant to change the engineering works by engineering works, the bank of the Maitai River, the river's floodplain and even the course of Kaka Stream is disrespectful to nature. I also acknowledge 
the plans they have to restore and revegetate, which are greatly appreciated. However, if nature truly had a voice and was speaking to you today, then perhaps its message might be something like this, its wish to be left alone, to be given the space and time to be its amazing self. Furthermore, it's concerning that the indicative master plan shows that around 210 of the houses proposed in the lowest and therefore coldest and dampest part of the valley will have as little as four hours of sunlight per day in winter. This would not appear to be a sufficient gain to justify the known negative effects of urban sprawl. The public is well aware that water quality is reduced in urban areas. Indeed, the Lower Muatai River within the existing urban area is generally rated as unsuitable for swimming by land, air, water, Aotearoa. The proposed subdivision is likely to reduce the attractiveness of the Muatai River as a site for swimming, especially for parents concerned about the health of their young children. If this plan change is approved, Whakatū Nelson will become less attractive as a tourist destination. Today, visitors and tourists who enjoy the lookout on Botanical Hill and enjoy the peace and beauty of the Lower Maitai Valley, they marvel at the fact that the city has such a world-class amenity area with an easy reach, open for all. I fear that if this plan change is approved, the resulting degradation to the experience of visitors and tourists will leave them with reactions such as, I thought the view to the east was of nature, not a suburb, and it was pretty, but so much traffic, and nice walking track, but a shame about the sound of lawnmowers and weed eaters. All of the above points show the great risks of negative outcomes in seeking to undertake urban development in such a sensitive landscape and highly valued rural setting. Many of the negative outcomes of the proposed development would result from the inherent nature of the proposal. That is, urban sprawl and the resulting change in the location of the urban-rural boundary. This cannot be mitigated against. Of most concern is that the lower Maitai Valley, which is currently in a rural setting, be, will be overtaken by the shift in the boundary, and will be in a, sorry, is currently a rural setting, and then will be in an urban setting. I would like to illustrate this via a series of three aerial images of central Nelson. The first shows the present urban rural boundary in red, the area of the proposed subdivision by a dashed white line, and the well used recreation area in the lower Maitai in light green Branford Park, Hanby Park, the swimming holes, and so on. Now, the second image we'll move to now shows the shift in the rural urban boundary if the proposed subdivision were to go ahead. And we'll see how um, the recreation area in Melvin Hills and Botanical Hill and so on, they're overtaken by that shift in the boundary. The current day boundary is still shown in pale red. Now the, these slides are approximate and schematic only. They're just intended to show the change in the boundary. Another worrying aspect of the proposed subdivision is that it would create a precedent for additional subdivisions up the valley as we've seen in pretty much all the other east-west valleys that come up from Nelson up and down the coast. Council has already identified a second development area in the Maitai Valley at Orchard Flats. The third image shows how the area would look if this Orchard Flats were to be developed. Again, that's approximate and we can see an even greater intrusion of urban sprawl around the recreation area. The 42A report gives caution to the fact that the issue before you is much more than a simple rezoning of land, that in fact it represents a large urban development in a sensitive receiving environment. I contend that the issue represents much more than that again. You are being asked to make a decision on a change to the setting and fundamental qualities and character of a large body of land immediately east of central Nelson that includes the backdrop to the city, important skylines, popular lookouts, and the city's prized recreation area that today is a peaceful rural paradise. Put simply, the effects of this decision go far beyond rezoning, affect a much greater area than Kaka Valley, and will negatively impact the thousands of people who use the area in a way that enhances 
the physical and mental well-being. In other words, I contend that this is simply the wrong place for residential housing. I would like to give an example of how the change in the location of the urban-rural boundary will affect the experience of people visiting the area. One of the most popular short walks in Nelson for residents and visitors alike is to stand atop the centre of New Zealand at Botanical Hill. Enjoy the feeling of standing at that urban-rural boundary today. Looking west, we see the city. Looking east, we see a beautiful rural setting of green spaces and trees, a wilderness playground that's largely free of development. Mr Milne considers that most people at this spot will be focusing on the view to the west, rather than toward the inland valley to the east. I'm not sure why one would expect people to ignore the beautiful sight of green hills and valleys, but I can report in my experience of climbing Botanical Hill on many occasions. Those at the top do three things. First, they recover from the steep climb. <laughs> then they look, in some order, over the city and enjoy the view, and then they look the other way over the beautiful Maitai Valley, commonly sitting on the grass to enjoy this vista. I know which view I find more peaceful and refreshing. Here are the two views. I find it thrilling to stand at the boundary between two such different settings, to see human development to the west, peaceful nature to the east. If the proposed subdivision goes ahead, then visitors to the lookout on Botanical Hill will no longer enjoy such a pure, purely rural landscape to the east. They will no longer have escaped the urban area, and they will not experience the joy of standing at that boundary with such contrasting views in each direction. Finally, a personal story that conveys an example of the value of the rural setting of the Mai Tai to young people. My children, like many I suspect, have a very hot, cold relationship with cycling as a way of getting around. But there is one activity for which they and their friends are very excited to travel by bike. And I live in central Nelson, by the way. That is when they are planning to swim and relax in the Maitai Valley on a hot summer day. Then it's the case of, Dad, can we use the bikes? Do you have a spare bike for my friend to borrow? And you can imagine why that idea is so appealing. Cycling on the quiet and safe Maitai Valley Road on a warm day, with few cars rolling through a beautiful rural valley, enjoying the peace and quiet, then swimming in the clean waters, escaping the bustle of the city, enjoying birdsong and open spaces. This is truly the stuff of treasured childhood memories, of freedom and calm and joy. Quite simply, it is quality of life. This is worthy of protecting for future generations so that young people will always be excited at the idea of rounding up a few bikes and heading up the Maitai Valley for a swim, to enjoy the company of their friends in a safe, peaceful setting of nature. Today I'm asking for open green spaces to be protected and for peaceful recreation areas that are so important to the health and well-being of the community to be protected. I'm asking for the values of the community as expressed in this hearing to be upheld and respected. And for the quality of life of children and generations to come, I respect, respectfully ask you to pause, to question the business as usual path that we are on, and to decline the plan change request. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. <clears throat> Thank you again. Um, very clear. I, I'd just like to ask you a question about a statement that you made. Just um, if this proposal is uh, granted and the, the plan change goes ahead and council approves it and the development goes ahead, you say it will set back intensification by decades. Is it your view that if no further greenfield development is allowed, that will force intensification and force people into living in a, you know, not, not everyone wants to be in an intensified environment. So the question really is, is it one or the other, in your view? It's certainly not one or the other. And we're already seeing that we are racing ahead with greenfield developments such as Marsden and Napa Two Valleys, the 2200 houses. Mm -hmm. And it's true that not everyone wants to live in a setting of intensification. Uh, I don't know the figures, but I suspect that at the moment, less than 1% of people in Nelson would live in a setting that you would call intensification. 
and that's not going to change a, a great deal, even if we do intensify to meet great growing right. demand. So the view is, again, in your view, there is already sufficient greenfield land available for people who want that form of lifestyle versus intensification, and this will just yeah, add it's, more it, that's unnecessary. It's not just um, greenfield land available, it's existing housing stock that is not intensification, that, that can give people space and options. My view is simply that this proposed um, development is it's just the wrong place for houses. Right. And I think you told us yesterday, I mean, you're, I mean, as part of Save the Mito, your, your major concern is the adverse impact of this outweigh the benefits. So you clearly see there are some benefits, but, but clearly outweighed by the adverse ones that you've put to us. Absolutely. And it's yeah. great to hear all the different sets of values and views being presented at this hearing. And it's a difficult job for the commissioners, I acknowledge that, because there are many valid, different valid views. But in my opinion, the adverse effects outweigh the benefits, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stella. Very clear, again, um, outline of your um, concerns and values. Thank you for that. Just one specific point of clarification. You, you mentioned in, in your presentation, and, in, and it's in your written um, statement as well, um, engineering works on the bank of the Maitai River. Can you just clarify for me what you are referring to there? Yeah, I refer to an, um, a figure in the material provided by the applicants. It's a cross-section that appears to show, and it deals with um, the floodplain in Lower Kaka Valley. Mm -hmm. It appears to show the lower half of the floodplain is being excavated, material taken away, and the upper half to be raised. And it appears that the excavation extends right to the bank of the Maitai River. Okay, I hadn't detected that. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Cheers. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Um, Ms Dooley, thank you. Welcome. Or oh, just so Dr. Stella or Tina Koto Ete Fana Co Elizabeth Dooley Toko Ingoa No Ayarangi O Kotipuna Kati Nohu Ote Fokatu Tena Koto Tena Koto Tena Tato Katoa. One comment on what I just heard. I live in a three-bedroomed house on a hill, and I would dearly love to live in a little apartment in town and leave the vacuuming behind. Um, I thought we in Nelson recognized we had reached a tipping point with rising global gas emissions, memories of the lockdown, and the rising cost of fuel. The only way for this smart little city to go is towards more intensification in town. We need to live locally, near schools, doctors, theatres, galleries, libraries, the hospital, and no longer be dependent on the private motor vehicle. That's what towns and cities in New Zealand can do to lower emissions from transport. In my admittedly inexpert opinion, to propose urban sprawl is so unfortunate and unnecessary it shows a lack of engagement with the mahi we all face to leave future generations with some hope. So far, the Maitai Valley Road has been a demarcation line between urban and rural, and breaching that line feels disastrous. Why stop there? Why not fill the whole valley? There are plans to build a science park at the port which will hopefully attract and retain intelligent young people who would choose to live in town and walk or cycle to work and entertainment. This is the lifestyle we need to embrace. I came to New Zealand in 1974 and settled in Auckland. Because of climate change, I decided to look for a place where I could live without a car as part of lowering my carbon footprint. I'd tramped around the Nelson province for years So I moved to Nelson from Auckland over 15 years ago and bought myself a bicycle. 
I'm doing as much as I can personally do to live lightly, sorry, on this earth. When I walk or cycle the busy city streets, I'm rather anxious. The people around me are anxious. Too many people seem unable to leave their cars at home. I'm not able, because of circumstances, to tramp anymore, but I need a peaceful place to restore my soul. And the Mai Tai is that place I can walk out of town and into nature. <laughs> Someone said the Karka Valley was unproductive land. No land is unproductive. Karka Hill could hold as many trees as Botanical Hill and play its part in maintaining our ecology. If it remains in pasture, it still provides a buffer and some filtering for the Mai Tai, sheltering us from the incessant noise and pollution of busy, congested streets. Karen Armstrong's book, Sacred Nature, talks of humanity's broken relationship with nature. I quote, hearts and minds need to change if we are to once more learn to revere our beautiful and fragile planet and to stop polluting it. For this to happen, we need to reconnect. To quote further, spending a few minutes each day quietly absorbing the sights and sounds of nature can help remind us that we are part of the world around us and depend on it as a child depends on its mother. When I turn away from the city and walk along the Mai Tai, please be quiet, Pat. Mm -hmm. I walk away from stress, cars, noise, pollution, and enter a place of renewal. Nature folds itself around me. Trees sway, leaves talk with the wind, birds cry out or sing, water gossips over the stones. Each October, the shining cuckoo arrives. If we encroach upon and eventually overwhelm this valley, we can never get it back. The Mai Tai and I share a common ancestor. We are entirely reliant on Papa Tuinuku, sacred nature. Namihi. Thank you very much for that. Do you have questions for Ms. Dooley? <laughs> Thank you very much. It was a very clear statement. Um, can I just make a comment? Uh, you, you know each other, um, all Mr. Taylor, and, and both of you are comforting a couple of the, the women. I, look, I don't know whether they know you and whether they welcome it or not. So if anyone is, says they're uncomfortable, and I'm not trying, I'm not trying to criticise you. I just don't know. Some people are not comfortable, and you might might know them. So we'll just check in to make sure if, if you're. That's a very gifted man over there. <laughs> Thank you. That's fine. As long as you're comfortable. Thank you very much for your presentation. Does Ms Holland come? Next? No. Mr Cooper. Can you stay back from us? Oh. Do you, have you got a mask? Can, have you got a mask? Can you hand that to Ms O'Shea? Okay. Thank you. What do you mean, sorry? I, I was just looking to see what it said. I can't see it. So. I'm sorry, I don't understand. Your notice on this one. No. Oh, this one. Oh, thank you. Sorry, I misunderstood. So I should say that for those who haven't been before, you've seen our, so my name's Greg Hill, I'm chairing, and Ms Ratt is the other commissioner. The other two commissioners, Ms Tepania and uh, Mr Nigel Mark Brown. Thank you. Is this on? Is this yeah. on? Yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, good morning, Chairman. Good morning. Uh, other members of the Commission, ca any councillors here? I'm not sure. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity to speak to the Commission this morning. And uh, my apologies if I'm repeating arguments already given by 
numerous other people. It's no problem. My name is Jeff Cooper. I have a wife of 40 plus years and three grown up children and seven and a half grandchildren. I grew up amongst coal mines, blast furnaces, and steelworks in South Yorkshire, England. And I remember as a very small child delighting in taking off my socks and shoes and dangling my feet in the hot river, watching the beautiful rainbow colours of the water as it flowed past. Of course, only later did I realise that this was in fact thermal pollution from the steelworks and an oil slick on top. So, it should be easy for you to understand my love and respect for natural environments. Eventually, I attended grammar school and London University, and I've been a teacher of science throughout my working life in UK, through the Pacific, and New Zealand. I am totally opposed to the proposed urbanisation of the Kaka Valley and, in effect, the Mai Tai Valley. My family and I are frequent visitors to the valley, enjoying walking, cycling, swimming, golf, just appreciating the nature and tranquility of it. And I also see a huge number of other people enjoying the freedom and pleasure that a tranquil environment brings, especially it's so close to the city. Mai Tai Valley is well used and is in fact a jewel in Nelson's crown. And to soil it, as proposed by PPC 28, is quite frankly unforgivable. The people of Nelson do not want this. In 2006, as part of the Nelson Urban Growth Strategy, residents were asked about a subdivision in the Mai Tai Valley. And I've got a quote here, the council summary. Quote, submissions were very strongly opposed to any residential zoning, unquote. And then the council took a stance on the matter, quote, do not provide for any residential zoning in this area, unquote. So why are we here today? Perhaps somebody here could actually give us an answer. Why are we here today after this history? For the current submission process, I also note that in support, uh, uh, the submissions have been given a point system, apparently. Support for the PPC 28, 71 points. Opposed, 966 points. Surely, this indicates exactly the same result as in 2006, i.e. submission strongly opposed to any residential zoning in the Mai Tai Valley. The petition opposing the proposed PPC 28, more than 10,000 signatures. So I can ask you again, why are we here? If anyone has an answer to that, I would be very grateful. Why has it cost us more than $100,000 to get here today? I say to this hearing and to the council, you can stop this. We are talking about the last rural valley we have, the very last one. How many there were to start with? I don't know. I can list a few, all of which now have urban sprawl. Marsden Valley, apparently 2,000 plus homes going in Marsden. There's Dobson's Valley, there's Brook Valley, Tui Glen, York Valley. They're all urban now. I can't name them all, but what I do know, and what we all now know, there is only one left. All the others have got urban sprawl. So, 
This decision is not to be taken lightly. It's not even a once in a lifetime decision. This is a once in a millennium decision. If this proposal is somehow given the go ahead, you know it won't be the last one. It will be the first domino to fall. It will be the first crack in the dam. So what will you do with the next proposal? And the next, and the next, and the next, because make no mistake, they will come. It's a very slippery slope, so stop at the top. Say no before the rural nature of Maita Valley is gone forever. I remember the submission by the planner, Mark Lyles, and his description, amongst other things, of the site as an unproductive sheep farm, low quality soil types. But nature has an amazing ability to heal itself. I'd like you to imagine New Zealand, 2050, predator free, and what our grandchildren will see flying again over Kaka Valley and through the Mai Tai. I would like to finish my submission with a quote from the current Deputy Mayor, which I read in the Council publication just recently, this one here. I thought it was very poignant and very relevant to this situation. And the quote is, a huge part of being good ancestors is that we leave the world as a better place for our tamariki and mokupuna. Please reject PPC 28. Thank you. Thank you very much for your submission. Um, it's clear what you're asking us to do, which yes. is not to recommend approval of the plan change. Um, Ms. Ratt, do you have any questions? Uh, no, no questions from me. What you're asking for is quite clear. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Now I'm just going to check on if Ms Holland is on. Oh, great. That was just thank you. That was exactly the point I was going to make. Ms Holland um, is coming in by Zoom, so we will go to Ms Holland now. Miss Holland. Shout. Oh, she hasn't joined. Um, Miss McShay, could you, are you, do you have her email or something? Can you just, we'll continue on and we'll see whether we can get her back if she's to come. So she's not here. And so she hasn't, she hasn't asked to connect or anything. Hasn't. Okay, so she may or may not be coming. So that's all right. So just checking in. Miss Hill hasn't arrived. Or there was Mr. Holland. I'm not sure whether Mr. Holland and Gretchen Holland are related. I'll just continue on the list. Um, I know that we might need to take a break because we are early. So is any of Libby Newton or David Eyre? All right. Mr. Eyre, are you here? Is it? I saw a hand go up. Come on. Would you like to present now? Can you can you shout more loudly? I, I asked, I'm sorry, I can't hear you, Mr. Taylor. Can you shout for me? Thank you very much. So, Miss Newton was here, but she's just outside. Did you say? Mr. Haynes is here. We might. I would say we are really, we will take a break if um, not here. So we'll just see if Miss Newton wants, is Miss Newton there? Do you know her? No. All right, so I think what we need to do is we'll just take a break until um, a few more summers arrive. Thank you, everyone. We'll just adjourn until then.
Before everyone leaves, we're just waiting. Miss Holland might be coming online now. Right, thank you, everyone. <laughs> Dr. Stellard and Mr. Taylor, just we are, Miss Holland is here, so we're just going to continue. Sorry, we just th sorry. What was your name? Oh, let me, oh, great. So, Tony, have we got Miss Holland online? She. Oh, right. So, Miss we'll, um, Newton, I'll come to you next. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome. Can you hear me? Thank you. If we see if we, we we'll see if they can resolve resolve it. But I think we'll just we'll continue. Um, we'll come back to Ms. Holland um, if we can solve that technological issue. And Ms. Newton, I think we'll proceed with you. Thank you. Welcome, good morning. We've got your statement. So I ready to go? Yes, please. Tēnā koutou katoa. Good morning, everyone. My name is Libby Newton, and 
appreciation to the commissioners. Thank you. Um, I think I'm rather than stick to my statement, which is repeating from my heart everything that other people have said so brilliantly, in my opinion. I'd like to just touch on some of the facts and answer some of the questions that have come up for me over the hearing. That's I've listened here a little bit, but a lot from home. Thank you. So I'm speaking this morning, as I've said, there are so many reasons to save the Mai Tai Valley, but I'm going to speak to my passion for health and well-being and from my own life experiences. I came to Nelson on my 30th birthday, and that's in the distant past. So I'm definitely speaking mm -hmm. now to support my own backyard. Mm -hmm. Proud of that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think there's much I can do for felling of the Amazon rainforests, but I can speak up mm -hmm. for my own backyard, which is the Maitai Valley. I'm very fortunate that I can leave my house and be in the river five minutes walking. And I love the fact that I can walk for as long or as short as I like. I can go for a 10 minute walk or a three hour walk. And often I notice that people stop on the track, visitors to Nelson, and say, how, long, how far does this track go? And it's true, you know, if you want to, and I have done it once from my home in the Brook Valley then, but it was um, at the top of the Brook Valley then, it's not now. Um, I've walked right to Rock's Hut, which is like a, a day's, the day's walk, without using a car. So you can go as long as you like. Um, so I've used the valley. My main purpose is walking and swimming. They're my great loves. I swim and walk. I swim daily in the summer for a long time, actually, a long stretch. And I, I do this with, on my own regularly with friends, visitors, foreign students who have lived with us. I remember walking before breakfast with a student from Japan who just loved it. And with my children as they grew up and now with my grandchildren. And my thought is in 2022, with hospitals stretched to bursting and information abounding as people have pointed out very, um, very and great information abounding about enormous benefits of the natural environment, I believe we absolutely must save this precious green space so near to our city. I agree with the speaker I heard before saying, it's our park, it's our mm. park. We don't want to build in our park. So with my interest in health, I began my working life training as a radiographer and I worked here in New Zealand and not in Nelson, but in New Zealand and in um, overseas as a radiographer. And then I traveled intensively, and this is 50 years ago, and I remember noticing then, 50 years ago, the, the natural spaces that were being destroyed by development. And so then I came back to New Zealand and I married and had children, and. I switched my focus from what I think of as the ambulance at the bottom of the hill to the top of the hill, i.e. what do we do to prevent illness, to stay well, and this has been my passion ever since. Um, so then I, I've listed um, quite a few at, at memories that I have swimming with my children, with their friends, now with my grandchildren, even as little babies just sitting in the mm. shallow water at Denny's Hole, when they're still only at sitting stage, I remember that. Um, lockdown, during lockdown, it was an absolute asset. It, the, the autumn colours were beyond glorious, and I have no doubt that it supported me in many, all the levels that it can be supported. Um, so that I'm like others, you know, I have memories of family picnics now, three generations of us enjoying ourselves together, birthday parties. This summer, um, a friend of mine, a childhood friend from Canterbury, moved here last year to live in Nelson, and she's joined us in some of these picnics. And I remember her this summer just looking at the 
children swimming and saying, oh, what I would have given for swimming holes like this when we were children. And we, it would have been, you know, it is so, we are so blessed. Now there are a few things that I um, want to, one of the things that people, are, you've asked about is the noise in the swimming holes when it's very crowded. And I've thought about that in the last 24 hours. I never notice that it's noisy. It's, we are lucky, it's so, still so peaceful, no matter how many people are there. And as people have pointed out before, very different from in the neighborhood with chainsaws and um, all those sort of things that go on. Um, I also saw a slide of um, some cows grazing near to the Maitai Valley at the bottom of the Kaka Valley. Um, a few cows on a green paddock. It has, to me, there's not a problem with a few cows being close to a valley. If it was intense dairying, then it would be a problem. I probably wouldn't have a problem of a few houses being built in the Maitai Valley, in the Kaka Valley. But the amount of houses makes it definitely urban sprawl, and it's not okay, in my opinion. Um, one of my favourite things in the summer is to climb up the centre of New Zealand and over onto the next hill behind, down behind the whenua plantings, and, to, and drop down into Denny's Hole and have a swim. Um, and then I walk back through Bramford Park. I do that regularly, two or three times a week, and it really restores and keeps me healthy. Um, even when that becomes not possible, I still have the flat. I met a friend older than me walking there the other day with a walking stick, and she went for quite a long walk. And so it can, it, it's, um, I remember uh, Dr. Clark Grill pointed out that it's flat walking land. Okay. And like a, um, another woman said, it's my tramping days are coming to an end, and, but I still have the hills and then I'll have the flat. And I feel that's very, um, very, really um, wonderful thought. So another question that's come up is, how would I, would I use the Kaka Valley if it was um, mm -hmm. planted? And my thought also in the last 24 hours, probably not. Why would I want to walk amongst houses even if around there is planted when I've got the whole Mai Tai Valley? Of course the Mai Tai Valley will not be the same with all those houses in it, but I, certain, I don't see that I'd want to go up there. I, I like it in natural environment, not a sort of a, a planted area that's planted all at once. It's not natural to me, so I, I think my response would I wouldn't use the Kaka Valley. Over the like others and who have been in Nelson for a long time, over the years I have seen all the hills and valleys around Nelson gradually covered in houses. And while I was raising my children, it was we lived a lot in the Brook Valley, um, but I have no objection to the houses up the Brook Valley. It's not our park. And so I remember also children swimming under the Collingwood Street Bridge and now I noticed this last, well nobody does that now, uh, but even this last summer, I noticed many, much fewer people um, swimming even at uh, Gurley's Hole and a bit beyond where I've swum a lot. Mm -hmm. It's, it, I know the tree fell down that had the rope swing, and that took a lot of teenagers away, but also I've heard comments, well, I don't think I'd swim there anymore. So that's creeping up, so please don't let it creep too much further. One other thing I'd like to mention is that for a few years of my life I lived in Montreal in Canada. Um, when we arrived there as a family, I was still married then, um, the children were 10 and 14. Montreal is as hot in the summer as it is cold in the winter, and that's pretty hot because mm -hmm. it gets pretty cold. <clears throat> there is mile upon mile of lakeshore because Montreal is an island, 
And I would stand there sometimes on a hot, humid summer day and imagine all the families picnicking, people swimming in the lake, but no, it's unswimmable. It's completely polluted. Um, my children were swimming in a swimming pool that was heaving, and I mean heaving, nothing like the Mai Tai, just packed person to person to person in the swimming pool. And I don't think I swam, I'm a really keen swimmer, but I don't think I swam the whole time I was in Montreal. The other thing we did in Montreal was we lived in an apartment building. I know for New Zealanders, living with families in apartment buildings is not always a first choice, but I actually really enjoyed it. Mm. We had, that was very safe for the children and they, some of their friends were on, in the same apartment building. But also we had time as a family to spend in the communal green spaces. So we didn't have so much time that to, we didn't need to put in time in our, in our property where we were all just isolated. We actually lived in a small space but then went out into communal spaces and met up with other people and used the facilities that were tended to by the city. Um, as far as vegetable gardening was concerned and things, they had wonderful, there were wonderful um, communal gardens. So you could still get your hands in the soil if you so wanted, you didn't, but you didn't have to. Um, I still rent. I don't own a house and I understand people have spoken or one woman spoke about the challenges of renting a house and I understand that in Nelson. It's not that easy because I live in a small flat in a, um, in a larger house that's actually now on the market so maybe I need to move. I think of my mother-in-law in Montreal who lived in an apartment that was owned by the city. So there was not the ownership that was, you were at, whereas the tenants were at the whim of the landowner. It was actually owned by the city, well maintained and permanent for as long as she needed it. She doesn't anymore because she has died. But um, anyway, so recently I saw a picture in a news article like last week of the meadows before and after 150 houses. I just thought the Mai Tai Valley with 550 to 700 houses, can we really in 2022 with all the information available to us do this to our valley? And I hope not. So I'm asking you please to protect these green spaces so close to our town, open to everyone whatever we want to do, walk, run, bike. Like the previous speaker said, every day I'm there I see other people enjoying the valley and I enjoy that, seeing the amount of people enjoying the valley. Um, I have no doubt that in the long term we would lose so much more than we would gain. So I'm asking you please to hear us, the citizens of Nelson, and reject private plan change 28. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Any questions, Ms. Rhett? No questions from me. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, presentation. It's very, again, very clear. Thank you. And thank you. You, you, asked, you answered the question I was going to ask you about plan change 28, if it's approved, would have more open space in terms of public access and public recreation, but your view is you wouldn't use it. I'm pretty sure I wouldn't. Yep. Why would I want to go up? No, that's fine. I, I yeah. think thank you. You made that clear why. So I, I was just saying I did have that question, but you had already self-answered it. So thank no. you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Have we managed to thank you? We've got Miss Holland um, sorted. We hope. <coughs> God, I've got Good morning, Miss Holland. Good morning. Aha, uh -huh, we've got you. <laughs> with, with voice. Yes, not an easy, not an easy task. <laughs> <laughs> it hasn't helped my um, nervousness. Thank okay. you. How, how, we've, got your, we've got your statement, so how, how do you want to present? 
Uh, okay, I just um, want to, yeah, I'll, I've got a few pages here that I'd like to um, highlight some of my stuff, okay? Thank you. Tina um, Kotu Katoa, thank you for this opportunity to speak to my submission regarding plan change, private plan change 28. Call Gretchen Holland, Toku Ingwa. My name is Gretchen Holland and I am Nelson born and bred. My Holland ancestors arrived in Nelson on the Bolton in 1842. I have Nelson in my bones and in my heart. I have lived in Ralph Inway and the Maitai Valley <coughs> sorry, for the last 20 years. My husband has lived here for 33 years. I have an intimate knowledge of this place. I pick up rubbish daily. I have helped plant trees on organized planting days. I regularly weed those trees and replant or stand them up again after the river has flooded through them. I trap rats and other pests. I weed old man's beard and other pest plants. I collect autumn leaves to mulch my garden. I walk, bike and swim here daily. My grandkids have learned to swim here. I love this place. I love to listen to the river. The other day, unprompted, my eight-year-old great-niece said as we threw sticks into the rapids on the edge of Sunday Hole, I love the sound of the river. Yesterday, unprompted, my six-year-old granddaughter said as we sat at the picnic table at Black Hole, it's kind of nice watching the river. I love to listen to the birds. Currently, the air is full of the sound of keruru wings flapping. The traffic noise of a large suburb would blot out these sounds. I love to watch and listen to other people enjoying these things too. If a large suburb's traffic was streaming past, would the young woman sitting in the sun on the seating at Sunday Hole pick that spot to strum her guitar and sing softly? Would the large group of former refugee families choose to hold their summer picnics at the Branford Park shelter? Would the countless Christmas family gatherings and birthday parties be held there? Would that group of youths choose to leap into <coughs> Denny's Hole after their mountain bike ride if the stormwater outlet was right there? I don't think so, and I don't know where these people would go instead that is so close to town and so safe. I love that there are no street lights in the valley and that you can see a great night sky from here. A new suburb would destroy that. Today I'd like to highlight a couple of points I made in my submission. The point one, the value of the lower Maitai Valley. With respect, I worry that the commissioners may not be aware of the value to the community of the lower Maitai Valley from Ralph Fenway to Nile Street. It is the prime recreation area of the Maitai Valley. It is, the most used, it is the most used part of the valley because it is so close to town and access is easy, because it is tranquil and green, because it is flat and can be used by the elderly, the disabled, young families with buggies and toddlers, children learning to ride their bikes, to name a few. None of these groups of people would be able to easily access and use the vast recreation areas and opportunities talked about by the developers. Not everyone jogs and mountain bikes, funnily enough. Maybe some of the residents from the Karka Valley Flat Valley floor will push bike into town, but I'm almost certain that very few of the higher up residents would commute by bike. The grades of the proposed streets are too steep and residents would not all be working in Nelson City. There is a marked increase in people commuting to work in Richmond. Put simply, the proposed subdivision would result in an eastward jump in the rural urban boundary so that the recreation area in the lower Maitai Valley would change from being in a rural setting of tranquility to being in an urban setting of traffic, noise and motion. Traffic noise and pollution from 750 houses, two to 3,000 people, and over 6,000 car movements a day are the opposite of the softer amenity values the Lower Maitai currently has. 
Is it possible to have the scale of development without spoiling the highly valued Lower Maitai's natural, peaceful and rural characteristics? I kind of think not. Kaka Valley is like an amphitheatre, noise funnels down it, over the Maitai Cricket Ground, down the river, through Branford Park to Hanby Park, Mill Street, Nile Street and Cleveland Terrace Hillside. During the felling of very large trees and, huge, and the use of large machines in the Kaka Valley's valley floor, that noise was magnified down the valley into the lower Maitai Valley. Everyday noise of a large new suburb like lawnmowers, barking dogs, weed eaters, and my favourite things, leaf blowers, would be um, a loss of quiet space and it would conflict with current recreational values. The whole ambience of the Lower Maitai Valley, the most used part of the valley, would be gone. Point two, the plan change would be contrary to many Nelson City Council policies and philosophies. Policies like Project Mahitahi, the Kotahi Tanga, Mōte Tai Ao Alliance and Strategy, Maitai Ecological Restoration Plan, City for All Ages, smart little city, to name a few. In recent years, Nelson City Council, in collaboration with local iwi, DOC and community groups, and with funding from the Ministry for the Environment, DOC and the COVID Recovery Fund, will be spending an enormous amount of time and energy and millions of dollars to improve the Maitai Valley, most of its, mostly in its upper tributary valleys and upper catchments. This work includes weed removal, pest trapping, extensive planting and plant upkeep. New funding from the Arbor Day Foundation has recently been announced. This is all good stuff. Kaka Valley is a large tributary valley. <clears throat> it is inconsistent that it be treated so differently from the rest of the valley. It is bad economics and policy to be enhancing one area of the valley while planting while planning to desecrate <coughs> another. The Oxford Dictionary defined definition of desecrate is one, to treat, brackets, a sacred place or thing, close brackets, with violent disrespect, and two, to spoil, brackets, something which is valued and respected, close brackets. The Maitai River is already overburdened with forestry runoff, silting, and existing stormwater and it doesn't need additional construction runoff or stormwater from a major suburb on an existing floodplain. There will always be natural events that cannot be planned for. The Maitai River and therefore Nelson Haven, Waimea Inlet and Tasman Bay are too precious to risk. They are our taonga. Um, I also, in my written submission, pointed out some of the applicants' information being misleading, um, like the billboard at the end of Ralphine Way clearly shows and labels Danny's Hole, but not the river upstream from it. It's there, but it is not obvious, as it has not been made as obvious as I think it should be. A lot of people cannot read maps well. Um, this is possibly the only material a lot of the public, general public have seen when they've come up Ralphine Way for a nosy. It also misleads people to think that there would be only 300 to 350 houses at the end of the road. And on um, figure 17A of the Maitahi Bayview Structure Plan, it shows a tiny blue squiggle, which I assume corresponds to the reference on their legend labelled existing river. I know this area well, and I can't work that one out. Both of these tell us nothing about the most important aspect of the proposed suburb the Maitai River. And Nelson, point four, Nelson Nature is a division of the Nelson City Council and it values food corridors and a large suburb in Kaka Valley and its hillsides would disrupt this mountains to the sea initiative. My pest trapping group works closely with Nelson Nature and our aim to us is to increase bird life on Botanical Hill Reserve, extending east to Denny's Hole by creating a safe place for birds overflowing from the Brook Waimarama Sanctuary. 
It borders the proposed large suburb in Kaka Valley. A large suburb's worth of dogs and cats would negate our efforts. And the quiet ambience of the walks all over the Botanical Hill Reserve and, um, and views from the top of the centre of New Zealand would be degraded. Point four, five. <clears throat> there are too many unknowns. If the plan change goes ahead, all future subdivision and building within Kaka Valley would be processed without notification to affected parties or the public, despite critical aspects of the development not being specified or supported by technical information at this stage. This unfairly excludes people from being involved in decisions that may affect them in the future. I'm nearly there. <laughs> I will finish by saying that the Maitai Valley has a greater value without developing it. If we can learn anything from what's happened in other countries and other New Zealand cities, it's that our buffer systems and green belts are being eroded. How many other towns and cities in our country are now desperately trying to clean up their waterways? Future generations will judge us harshly if this urbanising goes ahead. It will not be reversible and we have the choice. This is my third submission to NCC opposing the proposed development of Kaka Valley. I'm one of the almost of the 13,000 who signed the petition opposing the rezone of Kaka Valley. Incidentally, change.org record, records my address as New Zealand, no city mentioned, and Tony's address as Rotorua. As I have said, we've been both been in Nelson for years. Um, I suspect there are mm, thousands of other names era, address errors in this um, change.org document. It puts huge doubt on Mr Spittle's <clears throat> analysis of the change.org addresses and how many are actually local. Um, as I said, this is my third submission. <clears throat> um, so far, I felt unheard, ignored and betrayed. What more can I do? What more can I say? We should be treating the Maitai River as a person, giving it legal, legal personhood. Think Whanganui River and Te Uruwera. Not continuing with commercial greed, trumping the needs of the environment and the community who value it. Now is our chance. Just as Joe Williams said, the difference between property rights in a river and the kinship with the river is that one entitled you to use it up unless there's a parliamentary law that says you can't. The other poses obligations because it's your relation. Today I ask that you listen to my concerns. It is inappropriate to rezone this area to residential. Please reject the part of the private plan change 28 that involves Kaka Valley. Kumaite to Awa, Kumaite to Farua. The Maito is my river. Maito is my valley. Kia ora and thank you. <coughs> thank you, Ms Holland. Again, a um, very clear statement. I'll check whether there are any questions. Ms Rett, do you have any questions? Thank you. I suppose just a statement. I think it's become very clear to us <coughs> um, through these submissions and presentations and certainly from our site visits about um, the area you talk about, the lower Maitai, from um, from your property in Ralping way down into, into Nelson. So we are, we've become very familiar with that area, um, having visited it several times, also hearing your submissions. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. E, would you like to present now? Thank you. <clears throat> Apologies for the slight delay. That's right, no problem at all. We're, we're slightly ahead of time. Thank you. Just opening your statement. Thank you. Morena. My name is David Eyre. I've lived in Nelson for the last 38 years and in the Maitai, Maitahi Valley for the last 25 years. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. I appreciate your time. 
The decision I seek is that private plan change 28 is rejected. The reason is that our civilization is in ecological overshoot on Earth, which is producing many existential threats to ourselves and every other form of life here. This PPC shows no sign of treating this overshoot as the existential threat that it is, and therefore needs to be totally rethought. It's very important to see ourselves in context. Start by zooming out. We know there are billions of planets in the universe. The Earth was formed about 4,500 million years ago. Life evolved here about 3,800 million years ago. We evolved about 7 million years ago. If the lifetime of the Earth was a day, the whole of the last 50,000 years of our life here would have happened in the period of one second to midnight. All species try to expand and use all available resources. Those that didn't were eliminated by evolutionary pressure long ago. We're intelligent and we're social. So we learn and we share what we have learnt with our social group. We try to use our abilities to extend our available resources. We've successfully done that, become the apex intelligent species on our planet and gone into overshoot. More than the carrying capacity of the Earth. In the last 200 years, we have grown very rapidly, powered by the easily available energy and fossil fuels. At the moment, our civilization is using resources and producing waste at a rate much higher than the Earth can sustain. We have a materials economy that takes resources, creates products, uses them for a short time, and then throws them away to landfill. This produces many environmental disasters of which climate change is the most recent and the most important because runaway climate change threatens all life on Earth. There isn't an away. There is just here, us, our world. This is where we are today. The transition from planet dominating growth to sustainability is vital and also very difficult. It is the major pinch point of our species with everything in play for all life on Earth. This collision with limits must have happened before on many planets. Some civilizations will have survived, some not. What happens here is up to us. Our challenge is to recognize that we have reached the limits of our planet and learn to live sustainably, not just in greenwash sense by putting labels that say sustainably on things for marketing. We need to live within the energy supplies we have. We need to live in a circular economy so that all resources are recovered. All this and much more New thinking, in a short description, living well with enough. The world we can build from that can be wonderful if we can learn to do it. Instead, where we are now, we are still trying to use the same behavior from our younger days as the species that brought us to this point always trying to grow, always more. We are beyond the limits of more. We have to evolve new behaviors and learn to live in balance with the world, not just for us, but equally for all other living things we share our planet with. This is one aspect of what we mean by finite planet. Sustainability 
doesn't mean until the next quarter or the next council triennium. It means thousands of years into the future. If the PPC 28 development showed any real understanding of these things, it might be worth losing another piece of land to endless expansion because it would be trying, but it doesn't. It's just trying to continue with business as usual when the near future in the next 10, 30 and 100 years is going to be nothing like usual. In doing that, it adds some apparent nods to environmental issues to show that it is a little better than the last time we built a subdivision. We need something much better. Stop changing our forests to farmland, stop changing our farmland to houses. We don't need to use this beautiful valley, either of these beautiful valleys, for houses. We can easily grow much more slowly in existing housing areas with intensification while we work out how to live sustainably. I think this is the reason that many people are objecting to this development. They feel deeply the loss of the natural world and the continuous expansion of our towns and cities and they want to live more in balance I do too. With very good environmental design standards, something that really shows that we are trying to build a better world, some small developments in some greenfield spaces may be worth doing. Not in this case. This is an example of large, profit-hungry, low-density urban sprawl. In the RMA legislation, purposes and principles, it gives a long list of things we have to give particular regard to. The first one, as it should be, is kaitiakitanga. Two others are maintenance and enhancement of the quality of the environment and any finite characteristics of natural and physical resources. Last week, we heard a quote from John Alkington. People, planet, profit. It was expressed originally as planet, people, profit, after which culture was added. That's the main point. The planet has to come first. In this case, it isn't. No thought to energy use or circular economy or the amount of landfill or any other key changes. Just business as usual and pushing as much as possible down the road to resource consent. Business as usual isn't sustainable. And we have to deal with that. Or the legacy we will leave our children, Tamariki, and grandchildren, Mokopuna, will be a dying planet, the only home we have. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your statement. <clears throat> um, yes, there's a lot in there. Um, Ms. Rat, do you have any questions for Mr. Eyre? Uh, no questions, thank you, but thank you for that. It's a very clear exposition of why um, yeah, principles associated with why business as usual um, is not your um, is is not a your view of a viable way forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. When it's close to ten thirty, we'll take the break um, and um, we'll come back at ten forty-five um, for the next tranche of submissions. Thank you.
Thank you, everybody. We'll reconvene um, for the next tranche of submissions. I just want to um, just repeat what I said this morning for those who weren't here. Um, as you know, two of the commissioners are online and are participating remotely. Um, <clears throat> we've had the discussions with them, um, given that the issues that are getting raised by submitters now, which um, we're keen to hear from, but we we are hearing, um, we've heard a lot of them before, so we may not have questions for parties and not to take that as disinterest. We're really only asking questions for clarification. Um, and the questions that we have, um, Ms. Uh, 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 Tepanea and Mr. Mark Brown have passed those on to me and to Ms. Ratt, so we're generally asking them and they'll come in if they have any other specific questions. So on that basis, we'll just continue. So um, the next summit I have on the list is Mr. Haynes. Is Mr. Haynes here? Thank you. Do you want to come forward? Just in front of the microphone, please. And just the, you just need to turn it on by pushing down the black button and, sl and pushing over the, I think of yours is the same, in the button. Hello. That's yeah. it. You could get a job in a help desk. I think you need to turn it on, so it's per I think if you... There you go. That's it. Perfect. Good on you. Okay, thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, morning, everybody. My name's David Haynes. I'm a resident of Nelson, and I'm here to oppose the Private Plan Change 28 for the rezoning of the Mai Tai Valley. Um, the, the question to me, and, and hopefully to the Commissioners in the context of the RMA, is, is this proposed rezoning and subsequent development going to be better or worse for the environment? And there's a subsequent question, which is, is this going to be better or worse for Nelson as a community? So I'll take the first one. Do we think what will result in the building of 700 odd homes, will it make this environment a better place? Well, certainly uh, MPI don't and Landcare Research don't, because in 2018, they looked at the carbon sequestration potential of mixed grasslands and mixed bush in the context of uh, a typical sheep or beef farm. And this, this area will fit that profile. And Landcare calculated that that land, 310 acre, acres of, of mixed bush and grassland, would sequester 9.30 tonnes of carbon dioxide a year. And a subsequent report from some research into how much carbon dioxide houses pump out would say that those 750 houses would generate 4,500 tonnes of CO2. So we're replacing 930 tonnes of sequestering of carbon dioxide with 4,500 tonnes of generation of carbon dioxide. So clearly, Landcare Research think it's going to be worse for the environment. We've got an increase in road traffic um, and subsequent carbon emissions and also nitrous oxide, nitrogen dioxide emissions as well. Uh, that's going to be five times the amount of traffic coming in and out of the Maatai Valley Road, and, and that is from the transportation impact report from Gary Clark of Trans, tra, uh, what are they, traffic concepts. So again, they, they would suggest that this is worse and not better for the environment. We've got a Brands and Massey University study of November 2021 saying a typical new built detached house exceeds the government's net zero 2050 carbon goal by five to seven times. So clearly, Brands and Massey University think this is worse for the environment. Um, in the submissions for the plan change, they identify this could be 30 to 40 years of construction activity. Most construction machinery runs on diesel with the subsequent emission of carbon dioxide, sulfur particles, and smaller particle, particulate matter as well. Nelson City Council who signed the Local Government Leaders Climate Change Declaration and the Local Government Position Statement on Climate Change declared the following goals for the Council. 
that we would transition towards a low carbon and resilient New Zealand. We would reduce air pollution. We would support local biodiversity. We would adopt a precautionary approach with respect to actions that may accelerate climate change. We will safeguard the life supporting capacity of our environment, which is the cornerstone of the Resource Management Act. That we will reduce emissions. We want to nurture our natural resources and ecosystems as environmental stewards, promote biodiversity, environmental sustainability, and the concept of kaitiaki tikanga. That Nelson Council recognizes the value of explicitly incorporating climate change considerations into land use decision, district plans, urban design and development. And the council declared it would encourage more intensive use of zone land to avoid the need to build new infrastructure to reach outlying businesses, avoid emissions that would result from construction and from servicing and maintaining the infrastructure. So that's what the council says. And the, the um, urban development 2020 policies specifies that planning decisions must support reduction in greenhouse decisions. So if Landcare Research and Brands and Massey University all say this will increase carbon dioxide division, um, production, this would fly in the face of those declarations of Nelson City Council accepting that this proposed plan change and the subsequent development and building of 700 houses. So I mentioned the RMA and, and I've had a, have a few years in advocacy with the RMA and, and it's, the bottom line is it, it's the sustainable use, development, protection of natural and physical resources. But it, and it also explicitly mentions the effects of climate change. So uh, the time of submitting my report, and I'm not aware of any changes to it, but the submission for this private plan change had no study or impact report on the carbon dioxide outputs or effects of this development, nothing at all on it, despite it being explicitly recognized as essential in an RMA development and in the Council's climate change declaration policy and urban development policy. So you could argue that in the context of the RMA and the instruments that Nelson City Council uses to give effect to the RMA, which is their planning documents and their uh, national policy statements, that the climate impact and the carbon dioxide generation has com been completely overridden and ignored. The submitter for the private plan change in their structure plan environment report stated that changes in land cover such as increased imperviousness will substantially alter the hydrologic response to rainfall with risk of instability and scour within the stream so in english as i'm sure we understand if you cover a piece of what was grassland and pasture with concrete, you're gonna create uh, a, a large amount of water going downhill whenever we have events like we're having right now. Uh, there's some noise, 30, 40 years development, that you have to think of the noise, the environmental impact of noise and the health and social well-being of those who live around it. When we come to the social benefit or otherwise of this development, I have to look at these homes. And it's been suggested in the local media that um, as of July 2020, um, the average price of these properties being built was going to be 550,000. Now, excuse me if I'm, I'm conflating the private plan change with the subsequent development, but it, it will be naive to think otherwise that there's no other reason for doing this plan change and to build houses. So those houses will be mooted at $550,000 each in July 2020. If we were to use CPI figures, it would now come to about 685 and up to 852 September this year if we continue on the house price trajectory. If we continue on that trajectory to September 2023, the average price of the houses that are proposed to be built would be over $1 million each. So 
there's 13% of those have been um, suggested they will be affordable homes. But I would contend that with those house prices, it fails to meet policy 1AI of the National Policy Statement on Urban Development 2020, which states that we will have or enable a variety of homes that meet the needs, needs in terms of type, price, and location of different households. A $1 million house does not do that. A $1 million house supports Nelson's largest growth industry at the moment, which is building large houses for wealthy retired people from Auckland Christchurch and Wellington. So this is not meeting the needs, the organic needs of local population growth for young people and retaining and keeping skilled people here. It's, it's building Mac mansions for wealthy retired people. Now, if I was an elective hip surgeon, I'd be jumping for joy, but I'm not. So it's a non-essential development. It's more urban sprawl. The urban sprawl that we've seen in Tauranga, which I would suggest is, is uh, a mirror of Nelson in many ways. We've seen urban sprawl there, and if we start to do what Tauranga and Auckland and Christchurch are doing, we'll very quickly go from our smart little city to a big, dumb suburban sprawl. We're gonna lose a unique green and quiet space within walking distance of a city. Um, we will look at these undeveloped green spaces and we can look at their value, not in terms of dollars and cents, but in terms of the social value and the mental uh, health and well-being of people. And that's probably best illustrated by a study by Dr. Paul Blash, who's the Targo University of Wellington in 2013 and he wrote a paper called Green Space in a Resilient City, The Health and Wellbeing Benefits of Conservation in New Zealand. A peer-reviewed paper which explicitly states having green spaces and uh, spaces free of, of buildings and noise have a positive effect on our social system and subsequent um, positive effects on uh, the, the reliance or non-reliance on a public health system. We've got, <clears throat> alongside this proposed plan change, we've got the council spending 3.7 million investing in the ecological restoration of the Mai Tai. So on the one hand, we're spending 3.7 million of, of ratepayers' money planting trees and trying to fix uh, an anoxic river. And on the other hand, we've got the council building development right alongside it with the risks that earthworks can create sediment washing into that river. And we've had, the last few years, we've had enough rainfall events and enough slips and enough mud coming down the hills. In fact, I drove past one this morning at Adify to show that's a very, very real possibility. So that is the end of my presentation, and thank you very much for your time, Commissioners. Thank you very much. Are there questions? <clears throat> <clears throat> thank you again. Another clear um, exposition. Thank you. Thank um, you. But no, no, no questions from me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Lisa. you very much. Thank time. you very much. The next matter we have is Ms. Fraser by Zoom, and just we're just checking us if Ms. Fraser's online or ready to be online. Here we go. Kia ora, welcome. Can you hear me? Yes, can oh. you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, good. <laughs> it's a start. Welcome. Thank you. Shall I introduce myself? Yes, yep. please, and ha happy for yep. you to present to us. Thank you. My name is Marion Fraser, and I thank you that I can voice a submission, as well as the written one. Um, I really want to champion wild spaces, 
and want them to continue to be accessible to Nelsonians. So thanks for the chance mm. to speak. My connection with the Mai Tai Valley is um, a personal one. Um, my family photo albums contain a record of early birthdays celebrated on the banks of the Mai Tai River. Family and friends are sitting around a picnic rug with a birthday cake at the centre. There are bucket seats that um, the bases that you could take out of our old Austin and people are perched on there. And us kids are in our retro togs. Yeah. Mine looking homemade. Um, I, I won't submit the photos. <laughs> but I love the natural, simple childhood I was able to experience growing up here. And I want that for others. I want that to continue. I'd like to show uh, a framed photo, one of only a couple really that were hanging on the wall in my childhood home. And it hangs in my home now. And, and I still really value it. So I'm just gonna hold it up in front of my computer and I'll see if you can see it. See, this is quite high tech. <laughs> okay. I'll describe that photo because it wasn't very easy to see. It's got the um, Lombardies, like you see, Lombardy poplars in the Mai Tai Valley. And it, and it shows the first ford across the river. And there are wheel marks on the dirt road um, leading out of that ford. That, that road was very soft, you know, and the tires sunk in. And, and this image that hangs on my wall now is how I see the Mai Tai Valley still. It's an invitation to enter a natural area. And 60 years on, I'm still biking up there and listening to bird, bird song and, and swimming in the river and celebrating birthdays. You know. um, the qualities of the valley for me are that as I bike or walk up there, road noise and traffic drops away. I become aware of grey warbler singing on the left-hand side going up. And I become aware of the sound of a river on the right-hand side. And this happens in minutes on a bike from town. What, a, what an asset. And, and coming back down the valley, I return feeling nurtured and light, just flying along on my bike. And it's not because I'm pedaling downhill. <laughs> it, it just happens. And the effect of the proposed development would be the loss of this natural resource because water quality of the river would be compromised. And that, that would certainly affect all the way down to the sea. And visually, it would be compromised and there would be dwellings um, spoiling the skyline, um, spoiling the night sky with light pollution. And that's something I really value. The urban noise would make it just another suburb, a little bit like when you go up the Brook Valley. Um, another valley that I used to bike up on a dirt road as a child. Um, the sort of thought of domestic cats mixing in with um, the more natural residents up there, <laughs> animals, I mean, birds. What I'm asking for is the private plan change 28 be declined. And this is to prevent the irrever irreversible loss of an easily accessed natural area used for recreation and well-being by Nelsonians today. 
So although I've talked about the past and the present, I'm actually thinking about the future. And I so value that I can still swim at Sunday Hole with my adult children and my granddaughter. Um, so this is really um, an emotional mm. submission. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. I'll just check, Ms. Ratney, any questions? No, no questions from me, thank you, but appreciate your uh, presenting to us, um, so thank you very much. Thank you, no, thank no, you. nothing from me either. I think your statement is just adding to um, yeah. what others are saying, so there's a consistent message coming through from, from Smithers. Thank you very much. Thank you for thank coming. You. Thanks. <clears throat> Then Pauline Miller. Just, just before, can you just check your microphone is on? Is the red light on? Um, if you push down and then push the button over to the left. As on mine, that's how it works. There's a red light on now. Is that better? Yes, thank you. Okay. Kia ora koutou, ko Pauline Miller, Toku Ingawa. Thank you for the opportunity to speak at this hearing, for reading my submission and for listening to my presentation. I have lived three doors from the Mai Tai for 28 years. When we moved to Nelson, we searched for property to buy in this special area because my husband has many special memories of growing up beside the river further up the valley. He wanted his children to have the same opportunities and love for the river as he had experienced in his childhood, and still does. They use the amenities this area has to offer for swimming, walking, running, biking, building huts, and enjoying the natural environment and beauty and tranquility that it brings. And now our makapuna are learning of the beauty and experiences of the special place, so close to the city, but a world away. Our summers are spent in or beside the river, Swimming, walking, picnicking, biking. My husband and I swim in either Sunday Hole, Denny's Hole or Black Hole nearly every fine day over the summer months. Him more of, often more than once. And starting in October, I'm not quite so hardy. Any visitors we have are always taken for a walk up the river to show off this beautiful rural area so close to the city and its peace and tranquility. When our children were at primary school down Nile Street at Nelson Central, more often than not, there would be a swim on the way home at Gurley's Hole. Special, special memories. So the Mai Tai Valley holds a special place in our past, our present, and it must feature in our future. More than 13,000 signatures are testament to the strength of feeling around this proposed development that will spoil our beautiful valley forever. The Kaka Valley is part of the Mai Tai Valley, it cannot be separated from it. It is part of the catchment area and clearly visible from the Mai Tai Road and surrounding areas. As a primary school teacher, when it comes to teaching and developing pipiha with my class, I am proud to have the Mai Tai as my awa and kaka as my maunga. I gaze upon kaka hill from my kitchen window. As you can see, the Mai Tai Valley holds a very special place in my heart and in those of many, many Nelsonians. So, with the ongoing COVID, COVID epidemic, it has become widely known, reported and researched on how important green spaces and communion with nature are for our heora, spiritual, mental and physical well-being. During both lockdowns, part of my daily routine was a calming walk in nature along the Mai Tai walkway, past Black Hole, Denny's Hole and Sunday Hole, all popular and well-known swimming holes further up this peaceful valley and return. This daily routine enabled me to stay grounded and helped cope with the associated anxieties. Many, many other people also made this their daily ritual. If this proposed plan change were to proceed, this quiet, peaceful, calming space would no longer be this for the myriad of regular users. The swimming holes used daily by so many would be irreversibly affected should this proposal go ahead. The runoff and effects to the Mai Tai River would be ongoing and a threat to the local ecosystems. 
Visual pollution on the beautiful rural landscape, increased traffic up and down the valley, hundreds if not thousands of extra trips on the Maitai Valley Road daily, feeding into Nile Street, Tasman Street, etc. Air pollution, noise from constant traffic, not to mention all the huge trucks and machinery required for months on end to, to create a subdivision would be detrimental to the environment and the people who live in the areas and those who use it daily. The detrimental effects of stormwater runoff into the Maitai River and build-up of sedimentation would affect the local ecosystems and the health of the life-giving Maitai River. As I walk up the river trank in winter, I see the heavy frost on the Kaka Valley floor, the mist hanging over it, and the low sunlight hours. It is proposed that the 5.6 hectares of floodplain is raised by two metres. This would, what would this change do to the health of the river? This would require a quarry to be constructed further up the valley, resulting in lots of noise pollution and changing the character of the natural environment. All this traffic would create safety issues for recreational users of the area. I've, I've watched some of the previous submissions and I've seen photos presented um, of all the traffic parked along beside the cricket ground when there's um, games or events on there, through the Branford Park when there's lots of um, community events planned. The Maitai walkway is constantly in use with walkers, runners, bikers. Extra traffic would create a huge issue for users of Brantford Park, the Maitai cricket pitch, and users further up the valley, not to mention the large-scale events. The Nelson City Council have put a lot of time and money into ensuring this area is used for recreation. Why spoil all that? There would be irreversible effects on the wildlife in the area, especially the kōra, eels and other fish that inhabit the river. Numbers have already decreased dramatically in the time I have lived in the area. We used to see fish under the bridge up at Black Hole, haven't seen any for years. I know there's eels. <laughs> I regularly walk along the track from the centre of New Zealand to Walters Bluff, a great track to admire the views of the city and beyond. The proposal includes building houses along the ridge line and constructing a road mere metres from this above this popular track. Once again, noise pollution, visual pollution, changing the skyline forever. The country and the Nelson City Council are aiming for zero carbon output. The proposed subdivision would in no way contribute to this, the exact, exact opposite in fact. The Maitai Valley Road is fit for purpose, purpose at present. But if this proposal were to go ahead, the one-lane bridges would not cope with increased traffic, and it is proposed that three sets of traffic light would be needed down Nile Street. More visual pollution on our beautiful tree-lined Nile Street, or is it proposed the trees go as well? Increased traffic past Nelson Central School and M NMIT would cause major safety issues too. Section 5 of the RMA describes its purpose as the promotion and sustainable management of natural and physical resources to enable people and communities to provide for their social and cultural well-being while safeguarding ecosystems and avoiding any adverse effects of activities on the environment. If this proposed plan were to go ahead, this area of natural beauty and special character would never be the same again. It would severely impact the social and cultural well-being of the many users of this area. The ecosystems would not be safeguarded and there would be many adverse effects on the environment. I am also concerned that the National Environment Standards on Fresh Water 2020 would not be met should this proposal go ahead. The area which borders the proposed plan change area is an area of national significance and special character. The centre of New Zealand reserve borders this area and would be adversely affected by the proposed subdivision and associated effects. Noise pollution, tranquility disrupted, visual pollution with roads and houses in the view, only to mention a few. The Maitai River and its swimming holes are as synonymous with Nelson as Tahunanui Beach. They need to be preserved and enhanced not have extra stormwater runoff and sedimentation buildup and views of houses instead of green spaces. The council has an obligation to restore, preserve and enhance the environment for future generations. They have the kaitia, kaitia kitanga guardianship of the land. This proposed change would not meet these obligations, the only rural valley undeveloped in Nelson. Once it is gone, we cannot get it back. 
I also believe that adequate public consulta consultation has not been met around this proposal. In the Future Development Strategy of 2006, it is stated, Nelson City Council investigated residential development in the Maitai Valley as part of its Nelson Urban Growth Strategy, but concluded, do not provide for any future residential zoning in this area. And in response to submissions, the Council has decided not to pursue residential rezoning in the Maitai Valley because submissions on the Maitai were very strongly opposed to any residential zoning based on loss of open space, conflicts with recreation values and the effects of more traffic and noise. However, in the Future Development Strategy Plan of 2019, Nelson City Council identified land for housing expansion into the Maitai Valley for up to 842 houses in the Maitai Valley, 614 in Kaka Valley and 228 in Orchard Flat. This plan was reworded to say Kaka Valley, not Maitai Valley, resulting in very few people realising the beautiful Maitai Valley was under threat of being spoiled forever. The few submissions, four I believe, received on this future development strategy are what the Nelson City Council regards as full public consultation. They are now disregarding the thousands of signatures received in support of saving the Maitai Valley from subdivision. In conclusion, I strongly oppose the proposed Plan Change 28 in its entirety. We need to preserve the last and loveliest valley from development and ensure we are good ancestors and kaitiaki of this precious area. Thank you. Thank you very much for <laughs> Thank you for your clear statement. So any questions? Sorry. No questions? Sorry. <laughs> no, nothing. Nothing from me. Thank you. Thank Again, you. another clear Thank clear what and consistent view. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Miller. Mr. Fedia. Here we are. Ah, here we are. Thank you. Thank you. And I think we, we've got your statement here. Thank you. Welcome. Is this working? Is it working now? Yes, I think so. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you for this opportunity to uh, speak to my submission against this proposed plan change. Uh, my name is. Graham Ferrier, and I live 172 Cleveland Terrace, which is just over the one-way Clouston Bridge up Nile Street, just at the intersection with Mito Mait Valley Road. I've lived there for just over 11 years, so my story is very different to these people that have been born and bred in Nelson, and I want to explain that to you. I spent most of my working life in Northland, or the winterless north, <coughs> as it's often called, so that was a very pleasant place to live and raise a family. Before I go on, I'd just like to comment that I'm the third person this morning whose address has been changed in the record of submitters. My address is being shown as Matara, but it's clearly Mai Tai, and it's on my original submission. So right. it's an interesting fact that three addresses have changed this morning. The last 10 years of my working life were spent in Melbourne. When it came time to retire, I had to make a decision to return to the familiarity and friends in Kerry Kerry or to find an even more interesting place for retirement. I chose Nelson. And the reasons I chose Nelson are some of the main reasons why I oppose this plan. Firstly, I do not intend to comment at length on the many negative impacts of this proposal. Others can and will do that more effectively, and we've heard some this morning. I'll just say that due to my locality, I will see and experience those negative aspects firsthand. People pollute, and many people can find in one location pollute a lot more, much of which will end up in the river. I want to give you a personal story of how I see this proposal and hopefully express how others feel about it as well. I think that we need to stand back and take a big picture view of Nelson and its character and ask the question, what does this do to enhance Nelson? Sure, we need more housing, but it's a much bigger issue than that, in my view. How does this proposal improve Nelson as a livable city? I lived and worked in Melbourne for 10 years before I retired here to Nelson. Melbourne is frequently quoted as one of the world's most livable cities. Its main competitor for the title at that stage was Vancouver in Canada. 
I've also been fortunate to visit Vancouver. For 2022, out of interest, Vienna is number one, Vancouver is now number five, and Melbourne is number 10. And I think it's just a coincidence that Melbourne has declined since I left. <laughs> I will not go into the full details of the criteria used for this livability, but ask Dr. Google and you'll find much more. The most credible international rating body is the Economist Intelligent Unit. The first sentence in their explanation puts it in a nutshell. The concept of livability evaluates which cities around the world offer the best living conditions. The authors then go on to expand livability further and say, a livable city is one that provides inclusive opportunities for all residents, has access to green spaces, abundance of public spaces, efficient public transport systems and healthcare availability are all the hallmarks of a healthy, livable city. We know that effective public transport has a domino effect impact on public health as well by contributing less pollution and more fuel efficiency, while encouraging healthy habits simply by walking from one destination to another. It also makes accessing recreational activities easier. They give Vienna as an example. 50% of Vienna is covered with green space, from forests and parks to vineyards and gardens to the Danube River, giving residents plenty of ways to connect to nature within the city limits. Just think about Nelson for a while. We have our own city river, the Mai Tai. We also have a stunning coastline. Plus we have hills and forest, and in winter we have snow-capped mountains. We have our own unique environment that in my view rates with the best in the world. I said in my original submission that 10 years ago, I saw Nelson as a mini Melbourne, a highly livable city, and it still is. That was the decider for me, and why I live here now, along with other members of my family, including grand grandchildren, who followed me here because they thought this was a brilliant place to bring up, raise a family, rather than in the centre of Melbourne, for example. That is why, also why I'd like to protect what is special about Nelson for future generations. I acknowledge that it's more challenging for smaller cities like Nelson to support an effective public transport system. But smaller cities like us are clearly benefiting from the transport revolution that is happening with electric bikes, e-bikes, and don't forget the reference to simply walking to your destination. As a walker myself, I see many people walking and riding to their destinations in Nelson. We have a great climate for being outdoors for all sorts of activities, including that low impact commuting. After all, Nelson often wins the title of the highest sunshine hours in the country. Not sure we're going to win it this year though. Botanics Park, the centre of New Zealand, Branford Park and the Maitai River itself are already very popular biking, running and walking tracks. The Maitai River is the connecting thread and Kaka Valley is a key catchment feeding into the river. With this proposal it won't always be clean runoff water that will end up in the river. This is also the river where my grandchildren swim. As I've noted, the impact on the river, the swimming holes and etc is covered by many others that have been here a lot longer than me. The addition of potentially hundreds if not thousands of extra car movements through the intersection of Nile and Maitai Valley Road and along the road to the valley entrance would detract dramatically from that outdoor experience. There's lots and lots of bikes. I get frustrated as a driver, but they're quiet and they get on. We've got logging trucks at the moment. We tolerate them there for a short time. But just regular day-to-day -day traffic is going to ruin that. And as other speakers have said, the peace and quiet, listening to the birds, it'll be gone. In many or most cities around the world these days, a lot of emphasis is given to more high density housing, closer to transport hubs or the city centre. I'm not a town planner, but the logic is obvious, as we try to become more environmentally sustainable and reduce our climate impact. We're already seeing this type of development happening here in Nelson. But associated with that development must be easy access to recreational areas. As already mentioned, e-bikes have caused and continue to cause a revolution in low impact personal transport. But more bikes require either more bike tracks or less cars on the road, or preferably both. They support a clean environment, but also deserve a clean environment for the ride and not having to compete with more cars. Open space, as others have commented, is vital to good health, and it's referred to in livability, that quote I made earlier on. Our fast-paced modern lifestyle, and with more people living in higher density housing, 
having easy access to clean green spaces to enjoy peace and quiet is now even more essential. And that's why it's so critical we've got to preserve the Kaka Valley. It is mentioned above as a key livability factor, essential for people's wellbeing. So how does this relate to the proposed Kaka Valley development? But before I do that, I'd like to just briefly comment on the foundation of Nelson. The city planners of the time clearly saw that having parks and gardens was a key part of building Nelson and making it an attractive place to live. But I'm sure that they had no idea just how big Nelson would grow. Those tree-lined streets, the parks and the gardens are a real asset and now an essential part of Nelson's character. But they're limited in size and unlikely to fulfil the needs for the Nelson of the future. Who can see that far ahead? But we know Nelson keeps growing. Kaka Valley is the last easy contoured area close to the centre of Nelson. Even though it is not public land, it adds to the environment by remaining as farmland. Visually, it adds to the general openness of both Branford Park and the parks along the Maitai River. It adds to the peace and quiet. <coughs> I ask the question, once this piece of land has gone under houses, roads and pavement, what is left for Nelsonians of the future? For the, of the future? What will future generations think when they read about this proposal and the opportunity Nelson had to preserve this valuable part of its clean green character? In just 25 years, I can picture residents thinking, perhaps out aloud, if only the people of 2022 had thought far enough into the future. <coughs> Nelson City's fathers tried to do that and we're benefiting now. But the pressure is on, houses and streets or an open space that offers lots of options for future generations. As I said earlier, once it is gone, it will be gone for good. No second chances. As people, we have struggled to address the impact of climate change that will dramatically affect our grandchildren's futures. Can we even agree to prevent even worse consequences? But we do have a chance here to make a decision that will preserve some positive options for our grandchildren to enhance their well-being as the climate continues to change. As I've already said, once it's gone, it's gone. In terms of the livability in the proposed subdivision, there are those who can afford to buy and build on the ridge lines and higher country, and they will have a good livability. For those in the darker depths of the valley, they will at least have somewhere to live. I guess that will be affordable housing, but no thought at all of the impact on the livability for the rest of the Nelson community that I can see. Last week I heard a comment on the news that the Christchurch Stadium decision was a Goldilocks moment for Christchurch. It was just right and just what they needed to meet the city's future needs for a multi-purpose sports and concert facility. Perhaps they were thinking in livability terms as well. I asked the question here today, is this proposal just right for Nelson's longer term future, a future that we can only guess? or imagine, or should we leave something for the future with this land? We do have other options for housing developments, do we, but do we have more easily accessible open spaces? Will all our open spaces largely be on the steeper hills? I ask the question, is this Nelson's Goldilocks moment needing a Goldilocks decision? I would suggest that it is, because once it's gone, it's gone. There's no options left. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Another very clear statement. Um, I'll just check with Ms. Rett. Anything to add? Thank you. Very clear. Thank you very much. The next on my list was um, Ms. Collis is again speaking for um, Mr. Crossage. Is he here? She here? We'll come back to her if she comes in. Um, Ms. Howard, is Ms. Howard here? No, oh, great, thank you. Is that working? Can you hear me? <coughs> Just 
is that is that okay? Can you hear me? Is it is that on, Tony? Can you? It is. Yes. Thank okay. you very much. <clears throat> Um, my name is Ellie Howard, and thank you for hearing me today. I don't know the scope that you as commissioners have to work within, but I will do my part today to tell you why I believe the private plan change 28 application should not be approved. When I was in the early stages of labour with my daughter, when the midwife Stella said I still had hours and hours to go, it was the Mai Tai Valley that I chose to go to, to walk and walk and walk and lean on trees during contractions and seek solace. I didn't need a place that was empty of people. I chose a people, I chose an area where I might hear birds, see families picnicking, teams playing sports, dogs chasing balls, runners, kids riding bikes, teenagers swimming in the cold river, more elderly people taking an easy stroll or madly swimming. And with all this recreation happening, I knew I would still find a green open space and peace there. And that helped me through a very difficult and exciting day. The valley is my go-to happy place that I have visited nearly every week for the last 21 years. In mid-2020, I heard a rumor from a local, local builder friend about a large subdivision in the valley, and I just didn't really believe it until I saw the Stuff Shovel Ready article in June 2020. A few weeks later, I read about a public meeting, which at first I thought must be the council running a public meeting about this, but it wasn't. It was full of people in the pub in shock that something so hugely significant to Nelson as a subdivision of 750 houses had not yet been made public knowledge. At that stage, there were few details. I signed the petition because I am against the principle of greenfield urban sprawl in the Mai Tai Valley. As the months went on and more and more information came out, the community opposition did not weaken or falter. It grew and it is still growing. What I've learned in the last two years is the extraordinary lengths that the community have gone to, many like myself with little or no knowledge or experience of science, planning or government policy to become investigators, to research, inform ourselves and try to understand NPSUDs and updated NPSUDs, overlay maps, LVAs, SMPs, WSDs, whatever they are, and what is a Schedule X or a Section 42 report. The two council websites on the PPC 28, that's the Private Plan Change and the Shape Nelson website, contain over 300 documents. From these hard yards, hundreds of people in the community have done their best over the two years now to explain to the local government and now to yourselves of the plentiful and varied reasons why they believe a new suburb in the Mai Tai Valley is not the right path for Nelson. These numbers of people are evidenced in the hundreds of written and oral submissions to the annual plan, the Fakka Mahiri Fakka to Nelson plan, the long-term plan, the 2021 future development strategy and other submissions. It should be noted this high number of submissions are surprisingly large for a small population like Nelson. The community has written letters and emails to council staff and elected members, attended council meetings, signed that 13,000 strong petition set up by the Save the Mai Tai community campaign to stop this urban sprawl. People donated their artwork, they ran cake stalls, and they put their money where their mouth is with the donations so that this campaign can afford to engage um, some professional consultants. The community have been continually speaking up and despite all of this, there has been no engagement with the public, no site-specific consultation, no public meetings by the council or developers, no community assemblies, no natural justice. It is frankly overwhelming and unfair, and I know people who have found it too stressful to continue engaging with the process. The proposed subdivision is not in a closed side valley that no one can see or didn't know or notice before it was in the news. Karka Valley is the backdrop to the stunning rural views from the cricket ground, from Mai Tai Valley Road, from the Mai Tai walkway and the walkways around the botanics, and especially from the view, the view from the centre of New Zealand that is seen in so many tourist Instagram posts. These rural views will be full of houses, urban infrastructure, blighted landscapes. Save the Mai Tai is not called Save Karka Valley 
because it's not just about Karka Valley. It's about the last rural river valley and the idea of the Mai Tai Valley becoming a new suburb. It's about retaining a valued open landscape, an escape for people from the urban environment, people from Nelson, Tasman, New Zealand, and internationally. The sub proposed subdivision would result in the loss of tranquility with decades, and I say decades because that was in the application, decades of disturbance from earthworks, traffic, heavy plant, noise, and all right next to the well-used public recreation areas of Branford Park, Hanby Park, Waihitakaro Reserve, the Cricket Ground, Botanical Hill, Centre of New Zealand Lookout, and those picnicking, walking and swimming areas of Denny's Hole, Black Hole and Sunday Hole. These areas would become part of the urban setting. I've heard about the subdivision saying it will open up areas of inaccessible land to the public. But Nelson has plenty of urban areas where people can spend their time cheek by jowl with roads, cars and houses. This loss of amenity has not been addressed by the applicants. I have two last points. I know that the site is private land and it is currently zoned rural and I have no issue with that. But I also understand that the zoning from rural to residential is, in theory, a decision that should include the public voice. Um, here's a quote from the Ministry of, for the Environment publication on understanding the RMA submission process. The RMA is concerned with managing the effects our activities have on the environment so that the environment doesn't suffer. Although the RMA is a guide to what's important in our environment, it generally leaves the decisions about how to manage it in the hands of the local community. The RMA expects us to tell our local councils what we value about our environment so that they can look after it for us. This is because you, as locals, are best placed to know your own surroundings and you should be involved in deciding what's n what needs to be protected and how." End of quote. The amenity value of the Mai Tai Valley is being ignored and that is why I am here today. I just have one, one last comment. Um, I've heard this crazy notion that um, people from around the world have been signing or that the petition signatures are not local or whatever. I think there's two points. One, I think that shows um, if there are genuine areas of location that are outside of Nelson, that this is a much wider thing than just Nelson. However, change.org does not ask for your location when you sign. It takes a location from your email IP address. So for fun, I tried my geolocation this morning on a couple of websites, and I've got screenshots here. Uh, one says I'm in Auckland, and the other one says I'm in Hokitika. So I'd have moved fast if I had to get there, <laughs> get here from those places today. Um, thank you. That's my submission. Okay, and thank you very much for. <laughs> okay, and thank you very much for a clear articulation of your concerns. I'll just check anything further, Ms. Rat, from you. No, thank you again. It's um, again. Thanks clear and consistent message. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just checking, Miss Collis hasn't come in. She was here before I'd recognise her, but I don't think she is here. <coughs> if you want, if you'd like to, that's fine. Um, she was representing somebody else, so I'm not sure she may have decided that she doesn't want to come, so that's fine. Um, Ms Taylor, is Lindley Taylor here? Thank you. Welcome. Good morning. We've got your previous written statement. I'm not sure whether you're taking us through that or... No, but I would appreciate being able to read it. Sure. Is that all right? That's fine, yes. Good. Um, good morning. My name is Lynn Lee Taylor, and I'm a New Zealander who has lived much of my adult life abroad with my husband, who is also a Kiwi. He spent his teenage years in Nelson. I have lived in the Nelson region for the past 24 years, and now I live on the banks of the Mai Tai River, near the centre of the city, with steps leading down to the river from our garden. 
The future of this whole region and the welfare of its citizens matter greatly to me. And when I heard about the proposal to build 750 houses in Kaka Valley, I was stunned. I immediately thought of all the recent years of effort to improve the quality of the Mai Tai Valley environment, and then I thought of the immense negative impact the proposed plan would have on that environment. I personally know the incalculable value of freely accessible natural spaces to the citizens of urban areas. And I want to tell the commissioners how this proposal threatens the very existence of the Mai Tai Valley as a large natural public recreation area. My husband and I have long dubbed it the lungs of the city. On our property, we're always aware of the river. It's forever changing. At various times, there are white bait moving upstream, upstream, eels under the bottom steps, shoals of red mullet being pursued by shags, mallard ducks and paradise ducks and their families, seagulls galore on our roof as well, and even on one occasion, a seal who flopped its way up several of our steps. Twice a day, the whole ambiance changes when the tide comes in, and when the tide is high enough, kayakers, canoers, and paddleboarders may arrive. Further up the valley is where I walk, where I bike, where I picnic, and where I swim. Always marveling at how restorative it is to leave even my own peaceful urban backyard by the river to enjoy the natural expanses where no humans live. Marveling at the fact that this environment is available to all so close to town. I do not swim in the Mai Tai River at the bottom of my garden. The water quality there has deteriorated because of, among other things, urban runoff. Every time it rains hard, runoff from urban surfaces, roads, roofs, footpaths, rubber from tires, etc., gushes out of a large pipe on the opposite bank. This is only the one pipe that we can see, there are many more. But just up the road, at the end of Nile Street, begins the other Mai Tai, the one that offers relief from urbanisation, space to restore calm physically and emotionally. The other Mai Tai with water that has not yet been compromised by urbanisation. It is natural, not built, not man-made. It is not organised and it is free for all to use. It is inherently priceless and inherently fragile. I have lived in some large urban environments, London, New York City, Paris. I have used Hyde Park, Central Park, Luxembourg Gardens for recreation and to restore myself. At times of personal stress, I have instinctively retreated to those natural surroundings to be healed just by being there, sometimes just by sitting in the sun, watching the world go by, and even taking a nap, a powerful antidote to the stresses, strains, and pressures of an urban life. Over 150 years ago, Frederick Law Olmsted, who designed Central Park, understood the power of natural spaces as a social force that would become an amenity in city life over the decades with an exquisite kind of healing power. Of course, Nelson is not London, New York City or Paris, but we must pay attention to Olmsted's vision because Nelson is a growing urban area that is expected to intensify and expand dramatically, ever increasing the need for easily accessible, natural, restorative, and recreational spaces. Even although the proposed development would mostly not be visible from the Mai Tai Valley, it would have enormous negative, negative impact on all of the qualities that we value there. Try to imagine just how the Mai Tai Valley would be experienced if the proposed plan goes ahead. Imagine, if you will, the size of and the effect of the runoff 
from the hard surfaces that the proposed plan would create. Imagine the runoff from 750 roofs, from paved roads servicing those 750 houses. Imagine that runoff flowing through Kaka Creek and the wetland to Denny's Hole and thence into the Maitai River. Imagine the effect of the traffic produced by people making their way from those 750 houses to jobs, schools and shopping in Nelson. And imagine, if we allow this plan to proceed, how many more plan proposals will inevitably follow suit in the years to come once we have opened the doors? The decision you make about this proposal now will affect the Mai Tai Valley not just 30 years from now, not just 50, not just 100 years. If this proposal goes ahead, we will have lost the chance to protect this priceless natural gem forever. I am asking that this natural gem not be forfeited to the effects of the urban development requested in this proposal, and I am asking the commissioners to reject the plan change request. Thank you. Thank you very much for your written statement. Are there any questions? I do have one question. For, oh. Thank you. I do have one question for you. It's just an interesting um, observation coming from your statement where you say, of course, Nelson is not London, New York or Paris. Um, and you say Nelson is growing urban area, that it is expected to intensify and expand dramatically. In your view, where do you see the expansion occurring if it's not here? Well, two answers. One, I, I wanted to just focus on the other part of my you know, uh, submission. And what I would like to do, if you want an answer for me, if it would be permissible, rather than my launching into something that I... I'm not trying to trap, I mean, it's just an interesting observation because I think when we look at and talk to others, people, people are saying to us, Nelson will expand and people want to be here and, and clearly um, a lot of what we hear is people have come to Nelson because of all those attributes yes. and a lot of people have said to us, intensify, and I think we haven't heard many other people say, and it should expand, so the, re, really it's not. A, it's just a question, if, if Nelson is to expand... Oh, you mean outwards? Well, right. that's what I, I took from... I think it should go up myself. Oh, okay, all right, so you mean... You mean Expand is intensify to go up. I expand in, um, in population, perhaps, would be a right. way to say it. And right. they'll have, you know, they'll have to be housed somewhere. Okay. No, that's clear. Thank yeah. you very much. Sorry. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, those are all the submissions that were to be heard before lunchtime. But just, um, is there any other submitters who are here who were? to present this afternoon, want to present now? Is anyone here from this afternoon? Otherwise, we'll just adjourn until 2 o'clock. So we have no one here that wants to come. That's fine. Thank you, everybody. We'll just adjourn until 2 o'clock. Mr Marson. The um, council office...
very nice and very lovely hotel. Amy, what's that? No. Welcome back, everybody. We'll reconvene the hearing. Um, just very quickly before we do, um, Mr. Marston, I, I think you've received an email from Ms. Barton, as I have. Have you? You haven't seen it. We'll come. It's about the cyphers. We'll come back and we'll deal with it at the end of the, the day. Um, thank you. So we're just going to go back. So um, just get my list in front of me. Ms Collis, you are going to present on behalf of um, Mr Crotaz, and we've got a statement for you, so we, we adjourn too early. So would you like to come forward, please? Kia ora Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome back. It's my absolute privilege to present this submission on behalf of Serge Crotez, who's one of the most amazing mariners I have had the privilege of knowing. My name is Anne Colias. I present this submission on behalf of Serge Crotez, who is not in the country at the moment, having had to return to Switzerland for family affairs. Serge has a long experience of the sea, tidal movements and weather forecasting, being a sailor and having sailed from Europe to Aotearoa, New Zealand, twice on his personal sailing boats, as well as sailing regularly in the Nelson area. <coughs> he says, I agree there is a housing need to address, but I disagree with the PPC 28, as I believe the area to be developed is unsuitable for this development. In some of the um, attached papers coming from Becker, um, with Catherine Michelle Purton, point 20, which I think you have in front of you, commissioners, yes. point 20 of the provided document for the following example, extracted from the Nelson Tasman Future Development illustrates my point. Greenfield site N106, identif identified in the Mai Tai Valley, both Maitahi Bayhu PPC 28 and Orchard Flats, recognizing their close proximity to Nelson City Center and ability to provide for a new community of approximately one to 1,000 homes on the northeastern edge of the city. In point 20 in the attached pages, for the Kaka Hill tributary catchment, there is the possibility of future development occurring within the existing overflow flow paths and the waterway flow path, which have not been modeled and therefore not mapped. Point 23, this point shows that an increased amount of stormwater coming from the housing proposal will need to be going somewhere. My experience described above confirms that a combination of a king tide, intense low pressure, system and northeasterly storm wind associate with post-tropical depressions and the shallow water of Tasman Bay will create an accumulation of water or storm surge in the lower part of the Mai Tai River. And the flood water from the above storm will have nowhere to go. In other words, a perfect storm that will inundate the floodplain and the Mill Street area where my house is situated. In point 23, at, I think we've, number we've got six. The, miss, we've got point 23. I think yep. you're onto the conclusion section. Okay, all right, great. Okay. okay, now, conclusion then being, 
I do not believe the PPC 28 will resolve the issue of housing in a safe and ecological way, particularly in terms of the flooding risks resulting from the above circumstances. For the above reasons and many others presented at length to this panel by the significant majority of submitters, I seek that the private plan change be rejected on its entirety by the Nelson City Council. Thank you for the hearing panel for taking the time to hear and consider my submission. Thank you very much for that. Given, given that you're representing him, we can't ask you questions, so you're, you've represented his view. So thank you very much for coming in. How do you know? <laughs> well, I can't, I can't, I mean, we can't ask him questions because he's not here, so. Okay. Hey, thank you. Thank you very much. So just checking the next the next submitter, Mr. Jonkers, is representing two parties and is he's here. Thank you very much. We'll bring Mr. Jonkers up on screen. Yoda, hello. I can hear you. Oh good, and I can hear and see you too. Thank you. Um, One. Now Mr. Jonkers, you're you you've got your, your own submission and then you're also speaking on behalf of um, Trevor Carson and June Carson. I know your submissions are the same, so I, I'm not sure whether you're you wanting to sort of do it jointly and cover both or three, three sets of submissions? What I'd like to do is I'd like to read my submission, like to read to you what I've prepared. Um, and actually I have convinced June and Trevor to come to my house and they are, I'm just gonna move this, they are sitting here next to me. Welcome. So what, what I'd like to do is then um, after I've read this, we can play, or if you have already seen June's and Trevor's video that I've sent in, um, you can play that. And should you wish, you can ask questions um, to June or through, as she's sitting next to me here. Um, if I can do it that way, that would be great. Sure, we haven't seen the videos, um, so we'll probably play them I, they may well have been sent in, but we haven't got them. Have, we have, we've got the videos. Um, Tony, the technical person, has got the videos. So if you want to do your presentation, um, yes, and then we'll watch the videos. If you can. That's very kind, thank you. The videos are very short. They're two and a half minutes for June and one minute for Trevor, so they're not going to take up a lot of time. Um, but it was important for them to to do this. Thank you. Okay, so if I'll, I'll go ahead with my, um, with reading my statement that I'd like to present to you, and then we'll carry on from there. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Just, just to help me out, how long is your statement, just so I know what we expect in common? Less than five minutes. Oh, great. Thank you very much. And we'll come to questions after that. Thank you. Okay. So, good afternoon. My name is Paul Jonkers. I have lived in the Mai Tai, by the Mai Tai River, and very close to the Mai Tai Valley for nigh on 22 years. I oppose the PPC 28 for the reasons I'll endeavor to explain. My first encounter with Nelson was the summer of 91, when my wife and I toured New Zealand. Nelson left a lasting impression on us. The hills surrounding the city embraced the city, making it feel protected a tucked away little gem. That's what we thought then, that's what we think now. The city is reasonably well defined with open, sparsely populated hills surrounding it. When we had the choice of where to live for the first time in our adult lives, we chose New Zealand. And when we were fortunate to gain residency, we settled in Nelson. Our daughter was born here. I have never lived anywhere as long as I have in Nelson. It's where I feel at home. By chance, we ended up living in Nile Street in Nelson East. Little did we then know how special the area is. Having the Mai Tai Valley easily accessible has meant it has inevitably become part of our life. I had never thought of our house as cutting edge on the forefront of urban expansion. But it is. 
It was the first house to be built across the ford of Nile Street in 1857. And we are still at the edge of the city boundary 165 years later. And there's a good reason for this. The valley is known to be a cold and damp place. It is not a coincidence. This is the last resort for easy expansion. We have witnessed the small gentle stream that is the Maitai River become an angry raging torrent of water that sometimes needs more space, overflowing to the floodplain of Branford Park, closing the road. It has flooded the area between the cricket pitch and the river, another overflow area. We have seen the saturated fields to the north of the cricket pitch where some of the new development is proposed. I'm not an expert, but I do know that floodplains are an important fuse to limit damage further downstream. To have the main access road to a large suburb going through this area does not add up to me. The Mai Tai River is as synonymous to Nelson as the surrounding hills are, as the Boulder Bank is. Read the history of Nelson, look at the actions council have taken to restore the river to swimmable levels, look at the planting work that has been carried out on the riverbanks, a donation accepted from an overseas charitable institution and with one stroke of the pen, after careful consideration, this could all be undone. Yes, I have heard of the proposed settlement ponds and how they work. And yes, I have seen the walls of settlement ponds fail. If we ever reach the settlement pond phase, it is well too late. The population of Nelson has grown in my time here but we still have the same amount of schools as we've had before. These are now at capacity. Maybe we'll have to intensify the schools, build them up to cope with Nelson's continued growth. People would need to travel by car, which is going to create noise, pollution, and an infrastructure problem that the Nelson ratepayer will have to foot the bill for despite overwhelmingly stating its op opposition to this proposal. Take a look at berry fields in Richmond. It's flat, by all accounts, it's great for cycle commuting. It's on just on the fringe of town. It is just above sea level now, but it has created a traffic nightmare as everyone still commutes, even a short distance to town. Here, on our, here is a chance on our doorstep to not do what our neighbor has done, but to be smarter. Imagine this up the Mai Tai. What a nightmare. This proposal will take away a lot in what I value about the lower reaches of the Mai Tai Valley. The ease of accessibility to peace, open space, rural feel and recreational facility. I hope you have had time to climb to the top of Botanical Hill and look east. You see the valley as a whole, such an amazingly picturesque view. This view alone should sway your decision. Had Nelson City Council consulted properly with the public, we would not be in this situation. This area would not have made it to the 2019 FDS and yet here you are to decide whether or not this should go ahead. Amazing. It's a go, no-go decision. There is no middle ground. We have here a situation that should have never been in the first place. Hopes for development, stress against development, community fundraising, a David and Goliath situation is taking place here where the developers have seemingly endlessly deep pockets to conjure up blurb to convince you that we need more traffic and more affordable housing, which by the way is a nice topical term, but nowhere is there an actual commitment to build a specific number of these. My daughter is due to leave Nelson and to spread her wings elsewhere soon. 
which I support. I have always asked her to be proud of where she hails from and in due course to come back and show her future partner where she grew up. I hope she can be proud of this smart little city and proud of the decisions we're going to make today. I urge you to decline the application. Thank you. Thank you very much for your submission. Just, I'll just check at this side. Do you have questions, Ms. Red? No, no, no questions from me, thank you. Another clear uh, statement of your position. Thank you. Thank you for uh, providing it to us. Thank you. Thank you. Your statement is very clear. I mean, I, I'm not sure if you've been watching, but we've been saying that um, what you have told us is consistent with what a lot of other people have said, and we'll only be asking questions where we need clarification. So again, I think what you're asking for is very clear, and your reasoning is clear. I have, I have heard, and I have watched many statements, and by now, I, 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 I empathise with you hearing the same monologue over and over again. But it's obvious that a lot of Nelson, 13,000 of us, don't really want this to happen. That's what we're hearing. Good. <laughs> Good. Um, do you want to hand over, or do you want, to, shall, we, shall we play the two videos? Do you want them played back to back? Is that how the... Um, the Carsons would like it played? Would they like to? Yes, please. Um, so or, or you can play Junes, play Junes first, if the technical team can play Junes right. first. Is that the, long, then, uh, right. is that the longer the one? one that's, yes, it is. Okay, so let's play that one, and then we'll play yep. the other one, and then we'll go over to see if there's any questions. Thank you, Tony. Okay. Thank you. My name is June. Tariba Carson. I was born a Shalcress and I am the oldest of five. I have lived in the Mai Tai Valley since the early 30s, 1930s. In the early days, I slept outside on an open veranda when it was cold in the winter. The dogs would sleep on the end of our beds to keep warm. When it rained, we would push our beds together to stay dry. My father drove the school bus from up the Mai Tai Valley into town. We would go through one fort to get to school. In the early days, Miss Richardson owned a big area of the valley known to us as the Mai Tai Run, which is now the cricket match. We used to shoot rabbits, pig, deer and catch eels. We knew all the good fishing and eel holes for Tucker. There were lots to catch. The river was alive. The river used to rule our life. It was in control, and it should be. It is an important part of Nelson. Ian and I married in 1950 and moved to Anby Park in 1951. When we chose our plot of land, Ian said, looking out over Brantford Park, no one will be able to build me out. Having been a POW, the open space was very important to me and I hope it will remain so. When I was also, I liked to walk in the valley. When I was able, I liked to walk in the valley. The bird line, have picnics and be able to go tramping. The open spaces are a comfort to me. I am concerned a large development in the valley will affect the peace and the increased traffic will spoil the tranquility forever. Thank you. Is that it? That's it. So sure, I think we'll so, that, we'll, so we'll play we'll play the second video now and then we'll come back if there are any questions. Mm -hmm. My name is Trevor Carson. I live with my mother, June Carson. I have lived in the Maitai Valley all my life. I used to enjoy swimming in the river. It was kept deep in those days. I also enjoyed biking, tramping and feeding the eels in the clear water. I have seen flooding and fires in the valley. 
I have seen the build of the stop bank in Hamby Park to protect the houses and to make Bradford Park into a floodplain. I see the park flood a few times a year. I would hate to see houses built up the Maitai in Kaka Valley and ruin the open spaces. The traffic would be unbearable in the valley and the increased traffic on Nile Street unsafe for children. Leave the valley as it is for the next generation. Thank you. Thank, thank you for um, those presentations. C could I ask um, either Mr Carson or, or Mrs Carson, given that you've been in the valley for a long time, yes. can you tell us how the use of the, the swimming holes and the recreation areas, have they changed over time or have they remained pretty constant? I think they have remained pretty much the same. I went to live after we came off the farm in the depression years and went to live with my grandfathers and grandmothers, F.O. Hamilton and Isabel's batch. And it was a, um, a family holiday home. And having lived there, knowing what the my type was light in those days. It was very hard. We never knew electricity until mm. we came into town. Still swimming. We're still swimming up there, but it's it's if these houses go ahead, I I feel very strongly against them because Miss Richardson had the place which was known as the My Time Run. And I think my thoughts are, please leave it to the next okay. generation. Let them have the freedom that we had and the bird life, encourage the bird life and leave it as it is. Thank you, I'm 94 and I think that's pretty good for them, just at present. Thank you for listening. You're welcome, thank you very much. Can I just check with any further questions? No questions from me, but thank you very much for um, taking the time and effort to uh, give us your views. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Mr John. I, um, I don't have any further questions, I think, than the one I've already posed. So, but again, I think, I think your views and um, of uh, Trevor and, and uh, June, Carson, are very clear. Thank you. What, um, what I can say is... I see June often, I visit her often, and she often mentions how many people are going past her house towards the swimming holes. There are lots of young children that go past in the summer, and now she doesn't recognize people because there are so many more people. And of course she doesn't, but there are still lots of people that use the swimming hole. Thank you very much for your presentations. Pleasure. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mr Ward. Welcome, Mr. Ward. Are we working? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Um, I learned of the Kaka Valley proposal and the opposition to the proposal around the same time and put out a press release saying the conversation we needed to be having was not about whether we build in the valley, but how. My name is Mike Ward and I'm an artist and an occasional politician. It's almost 40 years since I first deliberated on housing under the old Town and Country Planning Act. 
By the end of my first term on council, I had determined that the rules and the process may or may not have prevented some dreadful things from happening, but there had been the recipe for mediocrity. Since those first hearings, we have continued to cover most of our, produ our most productive land with houses and consign vast numbers of people to long commutes and weekends spent trimming hedges and mowing lawns when most of far more enjoyable and productive ways that they might have spent their lives connecting with family, friend, neighbour and pursuing other interests. While we may have a shortage of housing, <coughs> houses, I doubt we have any shortage of housing. With an average occupancy rate of something less than 2.5 people per house and 26% of our dwellings at the census before last being single occupant uh, dwellings, we could far more cheaply meet any shortfall by reconfiguring our existing housing stock to make better use of the countless under and unoccupied uh, spaces. But since I don't expect to win that argument any time soon, if we're going to continue to build houses, we desperately need examples of exemplary neighbourhoods. Could this proposal be such an example? I believe so. Grazing is not a highly productive land use. With family veggie plots and community orchards, 2,000 residents could in all likelihood produce at least as much food as the land does currently. I might add that I've, I've actually run through that valley, it's a very beautiful valley, mm -hmm. a couple of times, one very recently. Um, I couldn't see any, any way you could keep the cow poo from getting out into the carcass stream. So I suspect that the veggie plots mm -hmm. would be environmentally more benign mm -hmm. than cows pooing in the carcass stream. With allotments and the proposed cafe and childcare, it could also provide the shared activity, connection and sense of community lacking in so much of suburbia. The Kaka Valley is not threatened by rising sea levels. It is also within easy walking and cycling distance of the city, and with a serious marketing job could provide an example, not just of an exemplary neighbourhood, but of exemplary and responsible lifestyles. Much of the conversation around housing these days is around affordability and supply. These are indeed important issues. But housing is also an appropriateness, an energy, a transport, a lifestyle, an aesthetic, a community building, an economic, a health, and perhaps above all, a sustainability issue. It is possible we may already have triggered the next mass extinction. Certainly, we are running out of time <coughs> to do what we must to avoid it. I believe the folk behind this proposal are genuine in their desire to address not just the affordability issue, but many of the other issues. Do I think they have all the answers? Nobody does. But if ever there was a time when we needed to start looking for the common ground and seeking those answers, this is that time. <clears throat> I know that there's provision already for cycleways into the city. They were providing the cycleways alone isn't enough. I think this could be that neighbourhood. Mm -hmm. I can see folk what, taking their time getting to work perhaps walking up over the hill and down through the centre of New Zealand. I can see folk building lifestyles where they could spend more time being there and less time getting there. I can see a school in there. I can see other... I, I lived out at Marybank for about 18 months. Between mm. Founders and the Glen, there was one coffee cart, a fish and chip shop, and a... Uh, a four square store. There wasn't a cafe. Okay. There were no shared activities. A sense of community. No, not really. People were walking their dogs, but there was nowhere to walk to. Mm -hmm. I would like to think that this could be a neighbourhood with places within walking distance that people might want mm -hmm. to walk to. <clears throat> Certainly, 
opposing it uses an awful lot of energy that might well have been part of a conversation to say, look, rather than saying don't or stop, what would we like to see there? The traffic issues confronting the city are vastly worse if we continue doing what we're doing right now. It took me 25 minutes to catch the bus from Nelson to Richmond. Mm -hmm. I was going to Golden Bay. 25 minutes for 12 kilometers? Mm -hmm. That was a quarter to four in the afternoon. This is much closer than that. That's enough from me. I urge you to not just to consent to this application, but to suggest to the council and to the rest of the community, we need to be having the conversation about what those exemplary lifestyles and those exemplary neighborhoods might look like. Mm -hmm. Because as I said, we're running out of time. Thank you. Kara, thank you. Ms. Rick, do you have questions for Mr. Ward? <laughs> I could have a lot of questions about how we develop those, the exemplary neighbourhood and households, but this is probably not the, not the place to be doing that. Um, I guess if you do have any comments on what you've seen in the um, material from the applicant, in terms of the degree to which you think it, it will deliver on the, the aspirations that you've talked about in your presentation to us. I understand the concerns of the opponents, and if, if you just built in suburbia in the Kaka Valley, I would be as disappointed as any of them. Um, so I'm saying, you know, let's, let's tease out what it looks like, and it doesn't look like ever smaller sections. I have a drawing on the wall of my studio. I didn't do it for, for this neighbourhood, but it could be, and there are people in it and there's a cafe in it, and the, and the dwellings are closer together. And people say to me, well, look, Mike, we have to go up. That is one of the options, but it's not the kind of option that meets the needs of human beings that want to live in communities. Um, and doing what we're doing right now doesn't meet the needs of people to connect, to share experiences, to spend more time being there and less time getting there. And so I think we need to be having that conversation. I don't know too many people who are having it, but I did write a housing strategy for the, for the council at the, uh, towards the end of my last term on council. Um, I don't know that it went anywhere, but it's, it's, I've written it. But it does suggest some of the, some of the options. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. your thoughts. Just, just one question for me. I mean, you know, we've been hearing a lot of um, views probably contrary to yours, um, and this term urban sprawl has been used quite a lot, that this would be an isolated suburban development. I think you have a different view in terms of, or do you have a different view of what urban sprawl is and this location in terms of the things you've been telling us about proximity to Nelson, CBD? Yes, I, I, I most certainly do. Um, <coughs> I think you could have pockets of development in there, not a village, but a series of villages. Um, people uh, giving everybody a piece of land on the presumption that they want to garden is not a very smart idea because, you know, I go around the town and I look in people's backyards and there's not a lot of gardening going on. Uh, but the idea of having allotments, and I've, mm -hmm. I've talked to the developer about this, um, it makes really good sense because it comes a shared activity, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. um, the idea of um, bringing people together closer and having shared spaces mm -hmm. rather than individual spaces makes really good sense. And that's a conversation, again, that needs to be happening between the council and the developer <coughs> and the rest of us. Um, we need to be looking at what, good, what examples there are around of um, comprehensive developments but the, the evidence is pretty clear that they are very popular when you, when you build them. Mm -hmm. They're the kind of uh, developments people like to live in, mm -hmm. those shared spaces. Mm -hmm. Understood. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for the opportunity. You're welcome.
Now the next submitter we have is Ms Charlesworth, also coming in by Zoom, and I'll just check as... Yes, she's... Hi. Oh. Hello. Hello. Okay. Hi. How are you? Kia ora. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you and see you. Awesome. Um, kia ora koutou. Ko Lucy Charles of Toko Ingoa. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I've lived in Nelson for the last 20 years as a Nelson resident, um, and along with thousands of other Nelson members of the Nelson community, I really value the unique rural character of the Maitai Valley and the much loved Maitai River. Sorry, I have uh, nerves here. Sorry, excuse me. Um, so I don't know if you've got an image there that I included in my submission that it might be there. Um, it's a word cloud yeah. that I sent in. Yep. Is there any way you can show that? Awesome. Thank you. So this image I've included is taken from a 2015 Mai Tai River um, users survey, which was commissioned by the N Nelson City Council. And I think it illustrates some of the key themes expressed by 419 people when they were asked to reflect on the area of the Mai Tai Valley they were visiting that day. Um, I think it provides a good succinct visual imagery, in, uh, summary, sorry. Not all the comments are complimentary, but it does highlight that the Mai Tai, Valley, Mai tai River is clearly at the forefront. The Mai Tai River is the heart of this rural valley. Um, the rural nature of the Mai Tai Valley is apparent from the moment you turn off Nile Street and onto the Mai Tai Valley Road. Trees border the quiet roads and hills surround the valley, and the seasonal changes are amplified in this space. Kaka Valley is integral to this space. The rural quality is even apparent at night. There are no street lights whatsoever from this point on. They are not required in this rural, I can't speak, sorry, rural landscape. Um, I oppose PPC 28, and I request that the commissioners recommend it should not proceed due to the negative environmental effects that this rezoning would enable. Current planning constraints should have ensured that the nature of this valley and the river would have been protected for future generations, and I think it should be kept rural. Um, this proposed plan change would allow the construction of a subdivision which is irrevocable. Development on the scale would have a significant impact on the sensitive receiving environment. The negative effects on the Mai Tai River and biodiversity would not would be impossible to mitigate. The health and well-being of the Mai Tai River is not at the forefront of this plan change application. In the almost three years that the developers have owned the section of land, they have only removed vegetation, have not planted anything. From Google Earth imagery, it's already apparent that a biodiversity corridor, which was viable and improving prior to their ownership in 2019, is now diminished. So the applicants have proposed an overlay of restoration, and I wonder if an overlay can adequately counteract and mitigate the impacts of 350, 500, 750 or more houses. I don't believe restoration can absorb this level of development at the construction phase, at the roading phase, at the high density housing stage. Biodiversity will not thrive in a high density suburb amongst lawn mowers, water contaminants and ubiquitous cats and dogs. Piwaka Waka and Keruru would certainly make tasty snacks for resident cats. The vulnerable green gecko would not stand a chance in such an environment. I was concerned in, during Wednesday's hearing when I was listening in at one of the developers who expressed bemusement at what people might be trying to save the Mai Tai from. For me, it highlights a lack of insight into the potential detrimental effects that a change of zoning would instigate. And this lack of sensitivity implies either disregard for these concerns or a funda fundamental lack of understanding of the significance that a change of zoning would have, or possibly both from one of the core applicants. And this does not inspire confidence in me. The Kaka Valley, the Mai Tai Valley and the Mai Tai River are inextricably linked and only any changes to the zoning will impact the space. <clears throat> so just going back to that image I showed you earlier, I wonder if you can visualize a word cloud resulting from a survey taken post high density subdivision in the valley. My belief is that it would look quite different from this word cloud. I believe it would be dominated by words like traffic sediment and shame. While I really hope that the words river, good and water would still feature, I believe they would be diminished. So please reject this planning change and keep the Kaka Valley and thereby the Mai Tai Valley rural for her, the whole world of current and future generations, biodiversity and the Mai Tai River. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Gabriel. Thank you very much again for your submission. Um, again, very clear. Um, I don't. Do we have questions for? Do you, just one mm. quick question on your word cloud. Can you just repeat for me? I'm sorry, I didn't pick up where you said that was developed from. Um, it was a, a 2015 Mai Tai River user survey. It was, it was also at the same time they um, took a survey of people's comments on the Roding River. Uh, so 2015, Nelson City Council, it's uh, available. You, you can find it quite easily, yeah. I think, if you... I can send this in to you if you want a link to it. That's fine, thank It would have been good at you. Sorry. Mm. Oh, can I just say, say that? Actually? Sorry, you go ahead. Just saying thanks. There's no need to send the link to it. I, now I um, okay. have where, it, where cool. it's from. So, yeah, thank you very much for your for your time and for connecting in with us. Thank you. Actually, can I just add about that survey? I was thinking when Mike Ward was speaking that it would have been a really good idea for the Nelson City Council to have done a survey, something like this, or the applicants or both, to have had a sense of how community would have responded if they'd had enough heads up to understand what was going ahead or was being um, suggested. And yeah, thanks again anyway. Namihi. Namihi. Thank you very much. Continuing on, Mr. Dahlberg. Mr. Dahlberg. <coughs> I think we have a PowerPoint presentation. Thank you. Yeah, good afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, my name's Bill Dalberg. I'm married to Sue. We have three children, seven grandchildren. Lived in Nelson for 40 years. Owned a Nelson business. Active in community in various roles. And was a councillor for three years. As you'll see, that's my original submission and title. I just want to focus on a few points, which I will group together and I'll let the experts cover the detail. Item one, Nelson City Council for many years held policies for intensification of existing building areas, that these should be maximized before any more urban sprawl is accepted. The government has made the priority of going up, not out, a priority for present and future housing for New Zealand. As a council of three years ago, the regional development plan showed there was sufficient land for housing in the Nelson region without this site. This is especially so as we have not seen the population growth, which was deemed to be 10% or over. It was as reported three years ago, this would not be the best use of resources in my opinion. Item three, the Mai Tai Valley rural character and amenity should be protected and preserved for the benefit of current and future generations. Suburban sprawl will change the nature of the valley forever. The proposed urban development will result in a loss of open spaces in the city's green belt. Item four, our communities are taking more notice of wellbeing and mental health issues. Undeveloped green spaces like the Mai Tai Valley are essential for a large number of people in our communities for health and well-being. Mm -hmm. Easy walking access level one and two and cycling level one and two is great for all age groups, predominantly our elder, which they enjoy this area. Item two, the development will create a precedent making further urbanisation of the valley 
much more likely to incur in the future. Our family has enjoyed the Maitai Valley for 40 years. This is an iconic area of Nelson and should be kept, away from future, kept that way for future generations. First, it was our children learning how to swim, enjoying nature plus fabulous environment. The opportunities to grow friendships, learning how to be safe. Some years later, it was the, their children and our grandchildren. The opportunity to enjoy the same experiences. All in the easy reach of the city being a major advantage. I am pleased to be part of the community that was gifted the use of this valley, a space from our city leaders over a hundred years ago. And that is really why I'm here, to follow that through. Mm -hmm. Again, the major concern is the precedent for further urbanisation of the Mai Tai Valley. The grandchildren love the track to get to the river, which is one of the pleasures of being a Kiwi and living in Nelson. It's the little things. It's like learning to throw rocks, feeding ducks, fairy trees, swimming, water swings, long interesting walks. Time to chat to these young people. In my case, I was running back for fitness uh, and then back down the road for speed. That road's just lovely, mm -hmm. small and safe. Uh, item six, ongoing sedimentation of the river from site works, plus hydrology changes and the pollutants from increased stormwater runoff from the new suburb will cause long-term degradation of the Mai Tai River. We will adversely affect the many valued community swimming holes nearby, including Denny's Hole, Black Hole, Gurley's Hole, and then the river flows down to the Nelson Haven which again <coughs> is a major venue for our communities. We already have flooded waters. Some photos of we took when we walk along the river in the years. Change the dynamics of the river. Climate change will increase in rainfall predicted. More built up areas, hard fill areas, more water runoff. That's the challenge when you're in the council, mm. when you're doing infrastructure. That will be another challenge here. I do appreciate the Nelson City Council have been working on the river environment, award-winning actually, uh, when I was a councillor. Uh, item eight, there is no existing public transport routes, meaning transport will be predominantly private cars. From our home on Atmore Terrace, we are 700 metres from the nearest bus stop. Mm -hmm. Not a problem for my wife and I at the moment, but in the community, uh, I don't think this is acceptable. Another point, while I was a Nelson Council, our Nelson City Council funded $100,000 for a business case for a cycle lift initially, end up being a gondola, restaurant, viewing platform project up the Mai Tai Valley to be situated by the Mai Tai Camp on land owned by Nati Kawata. The feasibility study highlighted the need for 100,000 or more customers to be financial. I was very supportive of this project. It would be prudent that this potential additional traffic movements should be considered in the plan, traffic planning in the plan change 28. Item 10, a lot of cities make the mistake of developing everything close to the city, though it is the cities that preserve green spaces, like Christchurch's Hagley Park, that are considered great cities involving communities. This is our councillor's chance, and now your commission's chance, to retain the uniqueness of the Mai Tai Valley with a show of guardianship and management of our environment and our community spaces. I hope Nelson realises how special the Mai Tai Valley is. If we lose this Nelson icon, it is the future opportunities for our communities and families gone forever. A 
Thank you for listening to my submission. Thank you, um, Mr. Dahlberg. Um, I don't want to pit ex-councillor against ex-councillor. Um, you heard Mr. Ward's presentation, who talked about the site, you know, and not being urban sprawl, and you have you clearly have a different view. Um, so you you don't accept his proposition that you know this is a site close to Nelson, and if it's done appropriately, would address some of the concerns that you have. Well, I was listening here, and the bit I picked up was. Mike would like communities mm. to be cohabitable and have village um, vegetable gardens. I don't think this proposal is that. Uh, Mike would like them in most places in Nelson, uh, and I do like his commitment in that level. But I do not no. think that is what we're getting. Thank you, Thank you very much. Ms. Reid, anything from you? Thank you. Again, thank you. Very clear statement. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Mr. Levy is Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I just make sure I know how to operate this. Um... Yeah. Oh, yeah, there's a big arrow. So just before you do, because I'm just, you've got, there's, is it two or three presentations? Uh, one, two, one, two. So you've got three, in our system, we've got three statements from you and some presentations. Is that what you want? Uh, I had a written, written submission from yeah, last December. Written. Yeah. And then I've got this presentation and there was a couple I'd, I'd, oh, good. Yeah, that I put in just about yeah. some of the things in here which I thought might support it because this didn't yeah. seem very clear. That's good. Thank you. Let's make sure my eyes are working. Okay. Kia ora, good afternoon. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak at this hearing. My name is Daniel Levy. I'm a beekeeper. For many years, I've lived rurally further upstream in the Mai Tai with my family. We love the Mai Tai Valley and enjoy the peaceful recreation reserves as well as the hiking and biking trails and playing in the swimming holes. Every day we see or join the many and varied people of Nelson relaxing or exercising in the reserves, enjoying and benefiting from the serenity of the river in its valley. This plan change threatens the Mai Tai's treasured rural amenity and tranquility. The loss of this would be tragic for Nelson. Kaka Valley is a very poor site for new greenfield development. I will not repeat all of my main objections as they're detailed in my written submission. I strongly support the objections already expressed by Save the Mai Tai and by others. The common theme is to request the decision makers to respect the land, respect the river, and to respect the people, and to ensure that this land is kept rural. The MPSUD does not ask for development anywhere or at any cost. This PPC comes at much too high a cost. The unavoidable effects of urbanization in Karka Valley would irreversibly negatively impact the potential health of the river and biodiversity. I stress potential. As with urbanization, this potential becomes forever capped by the realities of a degraded urban environment, while rural, rural land retains most facets of a natural landscape without such limits to future potential restoration. No other city in New Zealand has a better or more accessible rural green belt. This Tonga now needs our protection. The PPC's not consistent with rural green, green belt policy that states adverse effects on existing rural character and amenity values should be avoided, remedied or mitigated in the Mai Tai Valley in order to maintain a green belt. And as others have already stated, these adverse effects cannot all be adequately avoided, remedied or mitigated. I now wish to expand on a few of the concerns I've raised in my written submission, and I'll start with flood risk. The Mai Tai River is prone to flooding, especially when heavy rain coincides with a high tide. There are many historical records of the Mai Tai River breaching its banks, occasionally with disastrous consequences. Climate change will increase this flood hazard, and any additional avoidable flood risk is not acceptable. This photo I find quite impressive. It's from the Mai Tai Valley Road near Nile Street. And the next slide is from December 2011, a flooding event uh, a few hundred metres further downstream. 
that's just a contrast. And this event, I came to town to collect my two eldest children from school, and we couldn't return home up the Mai Tai until late the next day. I believe that the evidence and modelling presented is insufficient to properly assess and put the potential increased flood hazard on downstream properties. Even the applicant's latest stormwater management report acknowledges that the flood, the loss of floodplain storage could displace and redirect flood waters during an extreme event causing adverse flooding effects on adjacent and or downstream properties. Previously, there was an implied intention to maintain neutral floodplain storage capacity, but now it's no longer clear if or how floodplain storage capacity neutrality will be maintained. Land filling, on the, land filling on the floodplain is, is still prescribed, yet excavation is no longer mentioned as an offset. Such uncertainty does not give confidence in the flood risk assessments. The drastic irreversible proposed changes to the rich alluvial floodplain should not be allowed. The fertile river terraces should be preserved either for food production or for possible future restoration with bonus improvements such as its potential to offset increasing flood risks. Carcass stream would have naturally been a braided stream with multiple dynamic channels. So to remove the existing channel to maximize land available for development is indefensible within the context of Tamano Tawai. It's worth noting that revegetation proceeds much more quickly in undisturbed land. To achieve effective shading of an engineered artificial ditch would take many years longer than on the fertile banks of the existing channel. Regardless, there should be comprehensive riparian plantings on both the existing channel and along the ephemeral overland channel on the west side of the floodplain. Extensive earthworks on the active floodplain and on the hydrologically complex hillsides, diverting carcass stream, plus the threat of sedimentation and future urban water contaminants polluting the sensitive receiving environment for a housing development cannot give effect to Tamano Otawai. The MPSFM clearly identifies the Tamano Otawai hierarchy of obligations that unequivocally prioritises the health and well-being of water first. The proposals in this PPC clearly fail to prioritise prioritize the health of, river, of the river over the desire for profit and urban sprawl. Revegetation of hill slopes and riparian plantings are positive measures, but it should not be claimed that these will be sufficient to adequately mitigate the drastic hydrological and landscape, landscape modifications that are proposed. Expert evidence indicates that even the delicate wetlands that have already been identified for protection may not survive the planned or ac accidental alterations in hydrology. If the land's kept rural, any restoration will manifest as real improvements. If zoning is changed to residential, the ribbons of riparian, riparian plantings would be much appreciated, but would be forever constrained and compromised by the proximity of a growing suburb. Rather than making comparisons with a currently degraded state, we should be comparing the future potential for water quality and aquatic ecology with or without a plan change. Earthworks. Within the development site, bulk earthworks would be environmentally catastrophic, not dissimilar to open cast mining, permanently, permanently relegating the natural character of the valley to history. I grew up observing earthworks at a massive scale. It rips the life and heart out of the land. <laughs> Dust in the air and sedimentation in the waterways is never avoidable with large-scale earthworks. earthworks. I'll push on. These photos illustrate the impact of earthworks in greenfield subdivisions. This is not appropriate for the sensitive environment and hydrology of Karka Valley or the sensitive receiving environment of the Mai Tai River. The one on the left illustrates sedimentation control measures being breached on the Nelson subdivision. Such sediment smothers biodiversity downstream. This is what earthworks and greenfield sub subdivisions looks like. Please save the Mai Tai from this. The right-hand photo was taken by a neighbour of the Bayview subdivision. I have videos of sedimentation breaches from this site too. However, with this short clip, I wish to illustrate both the scale of impact on landforms and subdivision noise pollution. Contrast the clip that Wendy Barker played last Friday of the peaceful bird song by the river near Karka Valley with the incessant stressful cacophony of construction here. If I could play that clip. Sorry, I don't think I can do it from here. But can I do it from here? Not sure. <laughs> 
Does anybody want to hear that again? No, neither do I. With the plan change, this would be the reality in the Mai Tai Valley for years to come. Please save the Mai Tai from this. Oops. I could have done that, sorry. This again is the Bayview development, Google Earth images. Here I wish to highlight the environmentally destructive stages of Greenfield subdivision that would be inappropriate in the Mai Tai Valley. Top left, 2017, pre-development. Top right, 2020, stage two, vegetation clearance. And bottom right, 2022, stage three, earthworks. Bare earth, mud, dust, sediment, and noise are the immediate impacts. Biodiversity has been devastated. Long term, landforms and drainage patterns will have been permanently changed. Please save the Mai Tai from this. Sorry. Aside from the obvious destruction of habitat, this large clearance of vegetation, sorry, I might have got the wrong page. Aside from the obvious destruction of habitat, this large clearance of vegetation represents a significant disruption to the eight kilometer biodiversity corridor that stretches from Hira to Botanics. I have lost something here, sorry. Oh yeah, sorry. The Google Earth image here indicates quite worryingly that PPC 28 development is essentially already at stage two. Vegetation clearance is already advanced, reversing decades of regeneration. I measured about 76 hectares of the hillside from 2019 to January 2022. In several large areas, increasingly large indigenous flora was already winning the day. And it's a disruption of the eight kilometer biodiversity corridor from Hira to Botanics. Uh, the following images show that the cleared vegetation included large and ecologically significant areas of indigenous vegetation. The terrestrial values assessment work was compromised because it was carried out after April, uh, April after the land clearance. This is particularly significant as the assessment of fauna was heavily based on the vegetation community. Pre-clearance assessment would have been very different. Resource consent is required to clear indigenous forest, indigenous vegetation within a biodiversity corridor, and any vegetation within five meters of a river. These images suggest that vegetation clearance rules may already have been broken. The stormwater management report also suggests that revegetation will be used as an offset to balance increased flood risks, which is disingenuous in light of the large scale clearance, which will already have increased our flood risks. In an effort to improve indigenous biodiversity in the Mai Tai Valley, I've planted thousands of native plants and battled continuously with weeds that threaten them. I've been inspired by so many others who do the same. I celebrate every rare sighting of indigenous flora and flora, and it's distressing to observe such careless large-scale destruction of their delicate habitat for the yet unapproved development plan. These images show the midstream of Kaka stream the left is pre-clearance in 2020 and appears to be predominantly successfully regenerating bush. Typically in the Mai Tai Valley, this is Kanuka scrub with Mahoe and other native species outcompeting the, the, the nursery gorse. Zooming in further corroborates this, as do reports from those who knew this area well. The right image shows the land stripped bare with, all, with most small and larger trees felled by January 2022. Most concerning is that this particular area of the banks of the Karka stream have been left denuded and unshaded, which would have had a devastating impact on the biodiversity in and around the stream. It will take many, many years to recover. Actions speak louder than words, and viewing these images leaves me with little confidence that good environmental outcomes will be achieved if PPC 28 is approved. I felt that this RMA policy proposed policy is particularly relevant to my view of the issues. I believe that the vast vegetation clearance recently carried out is already a display of the poor land management practice. This policy doesn't allow for accelerated erosion. I won't labour on this, but landslips and erosion are already evident in many of the recently cleared areas. These are Google Earth images showing that. They're in the submission. 
These are some of the reasons I detailed in my written submission for why I ask that PPC 28 be declined. And this is a summary of the relief that I seek. <clears throat> I would like to add that I agree with others that any resource consents should be publicly notified. So to conclude, in my opinion, rural Maita Valley is treasured primarily because it is rural. If the zoning of parts of Kaka Valley are changed from rural to residential, we will have forever closed a beautiful chapter of Nelson's history. The myriad of adverse impacts on the neighboring recreation reserves, the river and beyond, would be unavoidable and irreversible, and the proposed mitigation inadequate. Since the PPC was first tabled, New Zealand and Nelson have declared a climate emergency. This is not the time for business as usual. The proposed development fails to address the anthropogenic causes of climate change or our emission reduction targets and obligations. From a carbon perspective, greenfield housing is far less appropriate than brownfield urban intensification. And Kaka Valley is particularly inappropriate. It is not contiguous with existing suburbs and supporting infrastructure is lacking. I respect the good intentions to house people in the valley but it is zoned rural for many good reasons. I believe it's well suited for rural housing, with the developers still able to profit, with future rural plot owners potentially enhancing the rural amenity. Perhaps a green rural village where people can truly connect to their land. Please respect the land, respect the water, and respect the people. Please tread lightly in the Mai Tai Valley and keep it rural. Kiora, thank you. <laughs> Thank you for conveying a lot of information in a short space of time. Um, Ms. Rett, do you have any further questions for or questions for Mr. Levy? No questions, thank you, but uh, just to reiterate what our Chair of the panel said, thank you for a lot of information presented very efficiently. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I have got a longer version which I'm, I was hoping to email in. <laughs> it wouldn't fit in the time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Those were the submissions within that tranche, but I'll, I'll continue on to see whether any of the submitters are here. Is, um, is Susan McCaskill here? I'd like to present. Would you like to present now, please? Five minute break? Five minute break, sure. Just check, is Mr. Smithline here? He is. Would you like to present now? So, Ms. McCaskill, I think we'll, we'll take Mr. Smith line, and when he's finished, and we'll come back and we'll thank you very much. Welcome. Kia ora koutou. Respected panel. Greg. Sheena must be somewhere. He's here virtually. Okay. Gillian. Kia ora. Nigel. Mm -hmm. Thank you for listening <clears throat> to me today. I'm Scott Smithline. My family now lives in Waka Waka. We revere the easily accessible Mai Tai River and Mai Tai Valley. It's a place we visit often. In 2004, my family emigrated from a city in America with a population of Aotearoa, New Zealand. It was 1,700 kilometers, square kilometers, of urban sprawl and we had to travel a great distance to connect <clears throat> with nature. One freeway to accomplish this is 26 lanes across. Growth is never enough. 
We were living in a place that was terribly disconnected from the environment, and a place where blinding consumerism could further distract. I know, because I was once disconnected too. We first visited Ezra in New Zealand in 2001, and the word God zone was new, and it was eye-opening. People, the astounding and always nearby natural beauty, balanced values that integrated life with nature, refreshing, healthy. The Mai Tai Valley, so near, factored big in this matter of balanced values and connecting with nature. At Founder School, our young daughter enjoyed riverbank plantings and outings to explore. At Nelson College for Girls, there were many outdoor activities there in Nelson's backyard. Running from Riverside Pool and walking up to the motor camp was my partner and my favorite route. <clears throat> Cycling to the dam, a dip in Denny's Hole, tramping to Rock's Hut. It's all nature at its finest. Our journey from to Whakatru and Wakapuaka awakened other connections with nature. For 18 years, we've planted only natives on a block of land here that, was, that once had a podocarp forest before it was cut, burnt, grazed, neglected. And thousands of trees later, we placed this whenua under protection, perpetual protection of the QE2 covenants, never to be subdivided, never to be logged. So why do it? Well, ethically, it's the right thing to do. And these are my values, and this is who I am. In Tereo studies, and apologies for some shocking pronunciation, it was great to discover my core values, my philosophy, my evolving spirituality, aligned very closely with Tao Maori, holistic, interconnected, interrelated systems of nature and man. I think we've reached a time for ecology to be considered before economics, a time to update and redefine old notions of progress and development, a time to listen to the earth a little bit more than control her and to accept every action in nature has a reaction and a consequence. When I read 42A, Appendix E, focusing on economics, cost benefits, measurable stuff, I wonder why we're not equally emphasizing the cost benefits of mental health and social well-being. You know how good it feels to be in nature. Biophilia, love of nature, it's a native affinity of life and living systems. And we may not be able to quantify health and well-being as we do economics, but is it not a valid consideration? And RMA material or not, the concept begs awareness as you weigh the submission that affects an entire town. When I see the private plan change, I see conventional mid 20th century solutions offered for 21st century problems. I fear urban homogenization will further threaten precious resources that are sitting right on our doorway. Perhaps you've read Max Harris's The New Zealand Project. We urgently need to embrace his three C's, care, community, creativity. These are cornerstones of progressive values. And when 12,700 plus people care enough to sign a petition opposing any commercial development, we must pause and listen deeply. Fresh Freshwater and water management are clearly part of our 21st century climate crisis. Personally, I embrace the Whakatokia Koteawa Koteawa Ko. I am the river, the river is me. I, I applaud the persona status given the Wanganui. It's an amazing, brilliant template for the future. 
but I fear the Mai Tai's voice is being challenged in this economics versus ecology equation. Te Mana o Te Wai prioritizes the health and well-being of water, and we must honor it with worthy and firm governance, which is your job at every opportunity. Clearly, by contextualizing who I am and my values, I'm also trying to influence the center of gravity and tipping point of what might be your razor edge decision making. I say razor edge because there's a compelling expertise on, on all sides of this plan change that might appeal to your personal lens, your professional leaning. My layman's approach to the plan change was to read, listen, and try not to judge, prejudge, despite my own bias. And to center myself, I focused on experts not paid by either applicant or submitter. So no Tonkin and Taylor, no Tectus, no Mr. Massa, no Ms. Gep. I wanted to explore this plan change with as much objectivity as possible. So for the record, I'm a pro former submitter. I'm one of the one to 11 crowd um, opposing. But today I'm focusing specifically on points four and five. If you wish, I can read these, but I uh, thought I might save time. You tell me, sir. It's fine. I'll just, I think, present the way you are is fine. Okay. To be as neutral as possible, <clears throat> I look to Ms. Purton's work on stormwater and floods, Dr. Fisher's discussion of water quality, Mr. Wilson on water sensitive design, and Mr. Ridley's expertise on erosion and sediment control. And taken together, their work shows the Achilles heel of this private plan change. As a layman looking at Report 42A, pages 30, 31, numbers 113 and 114, the National Policy Statement for Fresh Water 2020. I noted changes, or challenges, excuse me, challenges to this policy from this development. But I trust your wisdom and your experience to identify these two. I've read and reread Ms. Sweetman's reports, and I have the utmost respect for her. Is she here? She is online too, so she's. Oh. Thank yeah. you. Like yourselves, I've read 42A, addendum, page 22, table 1, number 10.14. It's entitled Water Quality, Flooding, Stormwater, Water Sensitive Design, Erosion, and Sediment Control. No change in Ms. Sweetman's op uh, opinion from the original 42A report because, quote, there's still outstanding matters that need to be addressed by the applicant, end quote. This is critical. Considering, again, these non-aligned expert opinions, I'm also perplexed by Appendix S, the six EWE management plans. I feel, on the one hand, I'm witnessing noble solidarity and trust on the entire development, despite serious potential threats to Tanatapu, the very ecological heart of Tao Maori, and I don't understand. I refer to Appendix S. Na Tonga Toku Ko Ki Fakatu, 2004, a collective statement from five iwi, except I believe Nati Kuya. Page six, point number one on the handout, and I quote Urban expansion is placing increasing pressure on existing infrastructure and associated facilities and increasing pressure on Nafanoa, the land and associated Tanga Tuku Iho treasured resources. Pressures include earthworks, 
associated with subdivisions in the development and improvement of roads have damaged natural habitats and Wahitapu sacred places of great significance to Tangata Fenua, end quote. If we scroll down to Appendix S, page 14, entitled Rivers, Lakes, Freshwater, point number two, I quote, that the natural functioning of life support capacity of ecosystems is not disturbed by discharges into the taking, the damming, and diversion of fresh surface water or groundwater. Again, I don't understand. We haven't time to address the many conflicts between moral principles expressed in Appendix S and our neutral experts' findings. Natikawada deserves a big paki paki for wonderful Maitahiawa work. And when I read submission 303 and note expressed values towards fresh water, I smile with gratitude. But when I look at what's proposed with this development, I scratch my head. The neutral expert voices, the Pertons, the Fishers, the Wilsons, the Ridleys, and their words, and those of Natikawata, are not in harmony. I've heard it said that ethics is knowing the difference between what you have a right to do and what is right to do. I know this is a complex commercial venture, but I also know a decision that violates a core ethic will never, never be the right decision. Thank you for listening, panel. Patai, questions? Thank you for your presentation. Um, what you've highlighted to us is, is, is obvious in the sense that we have contested evidence here. We have a number of lay submitters, you know, and I use that term in the sense they're not designated expert witnesses who present to us, and we also have contested expert evidence from the applicant saying that what they're proposing is appropriate, and we've still got, and we've, we've had submissions from expert, uh, uh, evidence from experts saying other things. So, and we've got the council officers still to hear from. So um, that is simply part of the process that we need to hear all the evidence and we would need to decide, as you say, um, what we think the right outcome will be and then we'll make that recommendation to the council. So thank you very much for your discussion. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. Chair, Mr. Chair. Oh, thank you. Mr. Mr. Mark Brown. Yes, Nigel Mark Brown. I just wanted to um, say hello to Mr. Smith Line. Thank you for your presentation and to advise them that um, I have COVID, so I'm watching this from my bed. However, my brain, I would say, is hopefully about 98% functional, and I've certainly been following all the submissions with interest. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Mr. you. Mark Brown. And I hope you're feeling better <laughs> swiftly and uh, that whatever you have there is, is very mild. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sislan, very much. We'll now hear from Ms. McCaskill, and then um, we will take the break. And, um, And then the final submit will be Mr. Stallard, who's, I think, in a meeting until about four or slightly after. Okay. So, we'll, so, but anyway, um, Ms. McCaskill, welcome. Um, Thank you. Got a statement from you. I think yes, it's a one very page. short statement. Yeah. <laughs> 
I just thought I'd say what I want to say. That's great. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, Good afternoon and thank you for taking the time to listen to me today. I am not an expert in any way, just a local who loves the Mai Tai area and would like to address this meeting about my concerns. Funnily enough, the petition I signed to save the Mai Tai has me registered as from New Plymouth, but I can assure you I have never lived there. I live in Nelson. I'm sure you have heard what I'm going to say from many other speakers in the last couple of days and today, but I'm glad to have the opportunity to speak about this issue as it is so dear to my heart, as it is with many other people, Nelsonians and visitors to the area. Today I will start with my connection to the area and then move on to why I think the proposed plan change should not go ahead. Like many other people in Nelson, I have fond memories from childhood of spending time up the valley or swimming in the river. I used to walk daily to the girlies hole to swim after school. I had barbecues up the Mai Tai as a teenager. We used to jump off the rocks into Denny's hole. We floated on car inner tubes and lilos in Sunday hole. I had a horse in the paddock that is now the cricket ground, and we rode horses around the area and swam with the horses in Black Hole. As older teenagers, we did the Nelson thing of driving from the beach to the Mai Tai and back again every Friday and Saturday night to see who was around. As you can see, the Mai Tai has many fond memories for me, as it does with many other Nelsonians. Having access to rural areas so readily made childhood and teenage years so much fun. As an adult, I still use the Mai Tai area often. I often walk along the riverbank or bike up to the dam. I swim in the river many afternoons and evenings in the summer. What a lovely experience it is. Therefore, when I heard that a major development or subdivision was intended for Karka Valley, I was astounded. Firstly, I had never heard of Karka Valley and just called the whole area the Mai Tai. Secondly, like many other Nelsonians, I had assumed that the Mai Tai Valley was a reserve or park already that had been reserved permanently for the health, well-being and enjoyment of Nelson people and visitors. I assumed the rural farmland of Karka Valley would stay that way as this was part of the Mai Tai Valley. Although I feel extremely angry and let down by the council about their lack of consultation for my own sake, I am mostly worried about how a major development in this area will affect future generations. I want to allow future generations to have the marvellous and amazing rural experiences that I have enjoyed and that have made me who I am. I want future generations to walk, bike and swim in the rural area of the Mai Tai Valley. Over summer, many people enjoy swimming in the river and picnicking on the grassy areas. I want those people to be able to continue to enjoy their experiences every summer and the rest of us to enjoy the peaceful and easily accessible rural amenity that the Mai Tai Valley allows us. Therefore, I will address the purpose of my submission, and that is the reasons I believe this development should not be allowed to go ahead. I really think the most important reason is that the Mai Tai Valley's rural character needs to be protected and preserved. As soon as you turn off Nile Street into the Mai Tai Valley, you can feel the rural nature of the area. There are fewer cars, and most people are walking, biking, running, or swimming. Having this area so close to town is an asset for Nelsonians. Being in rural areas are essential for people's health and well-being, and this also allows people to relax and decompress. A subdivision of 750 houses or so would change the nature of this area and the rural character would be lost. The subdivision might look beautiful and have trees planted everywhere, but it would not be rural anymore. I would prefer that this area became a park for walking, cycling and bird life. Furthermore, the council has received $3.7 million in funding from the government for Project Mahitahi. 
According to the Nelson City Council's website, the vision statement of this program is the mori or life force of the mahitahi is restored, ki uta kitai, so that native plants and wildlife can thrive within a functioning and connected ecosystem and people and communities are inspired to nurture and value the mahitahi as a taonga for past, present and future generations. What a great vision for the valley. However, I feel that the life force of the valley and river will be diminished if it becomes an urban area. You just need to feel the difference between the brook stream when it is in the bush at the sanctuary and when it is running in the urban area of the Brook Valley suburb. It feels like a different river. The difference in life force between the bush area and the urban area is palpable. I feel that the Mai Tai would become like that. After passing through a major urban area, it would become a different river. Secondly, the vision statement says that we should nurture and value the mahitangi as a taonga for future generations. I think this is very important. To me, the taonga of the mahitai area is its rural nature, and we should be nurturing that to enhance the life force of the river. Water quality is another concern of mine. I am not an expert by any means, but I think a major development in Kaka Valley would lead to degradation of water quality in the Mai Tai River. Ongoing earthworks and then runoff for houses will end up in the river, especially Denny's Hole. I really fear for the swimming, for the future of swimming at Denny's Hole, Black Hole and Gurley's Hole. Also, the impact this will have on Sunday Hole as people flock to the one swimming hole that is attractive and looks nice. This will be too much impact on Sunday Hole. I despair that future generations might not be able to experience the joy of swimming up the Mai Tai River. Zooming up for a quick swim after work or in the weekend with the kids will be something they never experience. To me, being able to swim in a river within minutes of downtown makes Nelson so special. Very few towns in New Zealand can boast that as part of their experience. However, the future of swimmability of the river is, je is in jeopardy. Just look at the Mai Tai River lower down after it meets the brook stream and runs through the urban area before it reaches the sea. This part of the river is nice to walk along, but no one is swimming in it. The water quality might be fine, but once the river enters an urban area, it is not as attractive as when it is in a rural area. A final concern I'd like to point out is that there will be a major increase in traffic, leading to an increase in noise pollution, air pollution and extremely busy streets. With thousands of more car trips per day down the road between Pramford Park, the loss of peaceful atmosphere will be noticeable. The amazing rural character will be lost. I prefer to see this area preserved in its rural nature for all to enjoy. I fervently wish future generations of Nelsonians the opportunity to enjoy this valley and this river in its more rural state. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pascal. Again, a very clear um, statement. Thank you. No problem. Yeah. Thank you also for me. No questions. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you Thanks. very much. Thank you very much for coming in. Um, just a couple of issues. Um, so, well, not really. So, um, we've just had the. No, Mr. Stallard will be coming a little bit later. Um, He's in a meeting in around four, so that's, that's fine. He, he was the last submitter today. Um, so we'll take the break now and come back when Mr Stallard arrives. Um, I think, and just Mr Marston, I think the issue of the site visits resolved. You're right, we're all good with that. So thank you, everyone. We'll just adjourn until um, Mr Stallard arrives um, later this afternoon. Thank you.
I'll just let everybody know that Mr. Stallard is here, but I think um, Ms., um, the other two commissioners will have gone off, so I think we will break for 15 minutes. So if we come back at, uh, if we come back at 10 to 4, and we'll continue with Mr. Stallard. Thank you.
Thank you, everybody. We'll reconvene um, for Mr. Stellard. Um, welcome, Mr. Stellard. Um, you've probably heard that two of our commissioners are away with COVID who are online listening and being able to participate, as, per, as is um, Ms. Sweetman. So um, we have all tested negative Thank still, you. so which is good. So um, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you. Thank you. I understand the, understand the difficulties. Yeah. I think everybody has them at the moment. So um, I'll just um, give you a wee bit of introduction in terms of my um, qualifications and what I, what I do. Um, I've uh, been a practising lawyer for 47 years. Um, I've practised uh, for the past 37 years in, in Nelson. I um, essentially uh, run my, my own law firm with a partner at the moment. I'm gradually easing my, my way out in relation to that. I have a reasonably extensive knowledge of the commercial and property and business structure and operation um, of the way in which the city works. Um, so I, I do come with some knowledge. It gives me no great pleasure to oppose this particular um, application. It just uh, happens to be, in my view, in the um, in the wrong place um, at the wrong time. And um, so I wouldn't normally stick my neck out on something like this, but it is important that it, in fact, is, um, is, is done. Um, as, to, um, as to where I, I live, um, I actually live, I'm the last house in uh, Nile Street at the Mai Tai end. I live up high, I look down Nile Street and I look directly down and I can actually see this, um, this hotel um, here. So I live um, what I call on the, on the, on the city-rural divide. Um, I do not agree with the way in which um, the development has been um, described as ultimately being um, part, of, uh, part of Nelson City. Directly behind my place is, um, is Nelson City Council reserve land that they don't look after particularly well and uh, that reserve land runs in a band right the way down to Black Hole, and there is continual um, uh, uh, green space that I can see from my, from my house. So I look down Nile Street, I look back over the centre of New Zealand, I look back over Branford Park, and I look from my deck, and I look from my living room back over to the Karka Hill uh, site. I can see that. Um, it is rural land. Um, it is not residential land and it has no place as residential land. So I see the Mai Tai uh, every day, I see Branford Park every day, I see it, I live it, I breathe it every day and I have done that because I have lived within proximity to that Lit River for virtually the whole time I've been in Nelson for the past 37 years. I bike it, I walk it, I drive the car down it and so I know a little about the river and what happens down there, and I know a little about the flooding and the effects it can have, because that has personally affected me when things go wrong on those uh, hills mm -hmm. and you have difficulty with water and um, flooding. So I bike to work for um, eight months of the year. We're in the middle of winter at the, uh, at the moment and it's too cold to bike, so I'm just mm. interested in some of the uh, information that's been come in relation to the way in which traffic has been dealt with in relation to this. Um, because ultimately, I was out at commuter time the other day while taking your kids to school time. I went out at eight o'clock in the morning and there was a heavy frost. And, um, and quite frankly, there was nobody else out, there was nobody else silly enough to be out there at hour, that hour of the morning. Um, but ultimately, I doubt very much in the circumstances you would expect to see uh, school children commuting to work. Um, the three to four kilometres, may I say, um, that it would take to get them to work whatever, um, whatever route they decide to take, it is not in close proximity to the city centre for walking, it is not in close proximity for biking, and the routes that they would take in relation to biking are not clearly set out and they are not clearly defined. So, so ultimately you end up in a position, there's about a four kilometre trek that they're going to have to make. I can measure from my house to my workplace, and that is 1.9 kilometres. So to describe it the way they have described it is uh, disingenuous to say, the, uh, to say the least. So when I rolled down the hill the other day, I came down on a narrow bridge, came across the bridge to the intersection of the Mai Tai Road and Nile Street. Um, there was ice on the bridge. 
So um, if I had been in the car and there had been another car coming from Nile Street along and I had a hit to have hit, the, hit my brakes in relation to that, Nelson City Council usually grit that bridge and they haven't done so at the moment. They haven't done so this year for some reason. So if I had had to hit the brakes because somebody didn't see me, and it happens all the time, um, I would have been um, careering down either into the river or directly down into uh, traffic coming out of, out of Nile Street. That intersection is uh, nothing short of appalling. Um, you can't run what they are going to run or propose to run um, up the valley um, with the traffic flow that's expected from that, with the roading structure the way it is. And you can't do it with the cycling structure that's here at the moment because it simply won't work. Now, I'm just going to, that was just by way of introduction um, in relation to it. You've got some detailed submissions um, there. I don't propose to actually read through those submissions. Um, I think um, you're in a position whereby you can read those yourself, but I can talk to some of those, uh, to some of the issues that are contained within there, and I'm mindful of my time limit as, um, as well. Thank um, you. So, ultimately, um, the... Um, this application, um, as I've said, it's, um, it's ill-conceived, premature and inconsistent with um, both government and CC initiatives. Can I call it, um, this is aggressive ad hoc planning. And um, it's opportunistic in relation to the way in which matters have been set out in relation to uh, uh, this application. It shouldn't really be before you for consideration, but it is, and you have to deal with it in terms of the information that is, in fact, before you. I accept that evidentially. You've got to deal with it upon the basis of the information that you have. So one of the first um, real matters that are for consideration is the, is the account, or no account, really, taken to the new Nelson District Plan. Now, to me, that would have been the ideal place um, to have addressed um, the overall development of uh, strategy and plans into residential and urban and rural development in terms of the context of the, of the city as a whole. Where we're at at the moment, because of staff difficulties, we are told that the Nelson City Council does not have the ability to process that plan uh, beyond the stage where it sits at the moment. So I'm not quite sure when that is likely to come back and come before uh, council, when it goes out for public consultation and where we are in relation to this. But um, unfortunately, the council has accepted or adopted, I can't quite remember which they've done, um, but, but, but ultimately that should never have been done. They did it on advice. I believe the advice was wrong. Um, but, but ultimately, they, um, notwithstanding the fact that there was a district plan in the offing, um, they still managed to uh, accept this, uh, accept the plan. And why you would do that um, when there's a new plan about to, to, to come out, why you would even progress with a plan change at this stage when you've got the uncertainty of what might come that's going to be dealt with in a comprehensive manner that involves the entire community justifies logic to me. So what we've got is we've got a bit of gap filling here that we've got to be done because nobody really knows um, what's going to be in that particular plan. It's got an entire submissions process to go through, then got an adoption process to go to, and then it's got an appeal process that needs to be gone through. And um, the, the regular lifespan of a plan um, can take you a um, considerable period of time to, to get through, it can take you up to five, six years to get through by the time you're through the, through the appeal process. We did, um, there was one big plan change that was done through in Nelson. It took over a period of 15 years to actually get this, uh, to get the plan changed through, and it was tied up with the water space area in Tasman Bay. Um, that, was a, that was a plan change. 15 years it took the process to get through. So ultimately what we've, um, so we don't have a district plan on which to us even begin to assess this. So you're looking at it, you're looking at it, I, I guess, in, um, not really in some sort of holistic way at all. You're looking at it in, a, in an ad hoc um, sort of sort of way. You then can turn, I guess, there to um, the future development strategy. You've heard quite a lot, I think, about the future development <coughs> strategy, and I probably don't need to labour the point in relation to the future development strategy. But um, um, the, the fact, I think, uh, in, uh, whether there was adequate consultation, it was probably a matter that should have been judicially reviewed at the time as to whether the council should or um, shouldn't have, uh, how they should have adopted that plan or what they should have done. Um, but, but again, um, really you've got an outdated future development um, uh, strategy. It's been, uh, now been replaced. It was adopted initially in, um, in rather uh, dubious circumstances. Um, um, 
Uh, nobody, I think, at that particular stage had even heard of the Kaka Valley. Even this room is called the Maitai Room. It was the Kaka Room, I doubt, was I'd even found my way here. So, so ultimately, um, nobody knew what the Kaka Valley is, so they consulted on um, something, and now what we find is a plan change essentially um, being put before you upon the basis of a, of a document that was simply not consulted on properly and, um, and should never have, um, should never have uh, seen the light of day in the form that it, that it did. And again, disingenuous to come here based upon a plan that really is quite, quite outdated. So. I, guess, I suppose I should step in. I, I'm not sure it's much point pursuing this line of, of argument because I think you were at the preliminary meeting that Ms Oliver ran and understood the whole idea of the private plan change. I understand from Ms Day the council has decided not to advance an update of its district plan until after the RMA amendments are made, which best guess later next year. Um, and this application, the private plan change application, has been legitimately brought and as you know, the council simply accepted it because that's what the law required. The council could have rejected it, but said there was no basis to. So hence, we're here to process it. And it, it is—it's not so much oh. about reading the district plan. I mean, there are other—you know—you know the hierarchy of these documents. We've got national policy statements and got the regional policy statement. And this proposal is to change the district plan. So I just think there's, there's little point in kind of pursuing that line of argument because legally, it, it, it does—it doesn't take us anywhere. And, you, yeah. and as a lawyer, I suspect you'll understand that process issue. Well, it's a process issue, but it's also a, it's a, it's also a matter of what is the what is the community importance that you that you place upon the processes that have been go, been gone through to gauge uh, the way in which the the public have had input in relation to this. So um, I, I'm not sure I entirely agree with the analysis that you're making in relation to that. You're free to take your view on that, of course. And I have a different view in relation to the way this matter is promulgated. You're free to reject that, of course. Um, but I, I see it. What I'm saying is I don't think there's value in taking no, up no. your time to present it because if that's the, that's what, if, although if that's the argument I want to put, then that's fine. But um, as I said, we've limited everyone to some time. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Um, so we've, we've, we've covered the, um, so I, um, you're obviously not going to want to hear about inadequate consultation, so I'll, I'll brush over that as well. Well, we have heard from a lot of some to say that the consultation process has been inadequate, um, and I, I imagine what the applicant will say, you know, this, this has been appropriately addressed and has been publicly notified, and a lot of people have made submissions, and hence we are here um, hearing all sides of the argument and we are to take all that information and make a recommendation. Yeah, I, look, I, I, I understand what you have to take into account. Um, there's also the issue in relation to the uh, to the new um, future development strategy that also has to be um, ultimately uh, considered by council. I understand it is likely to come back before council in um, in August, and um, what we don't know the future in relation to that. So at the very least, I would have thought you might have. Um, might have wanted some information in relation to how that was going to be. Well, how you factor that into your decision, I don't know, um, because, because ultimately it's a um, um, it's a matter. This matter, is the, this application has uh, progressed without the benefit of um, of that particular document, and the the, the importance in the submission. Is, is ultimately it's the, it's the wrong document mm -hmm. that they relied upon to bring this application. So just on that, we have we have been discussing the extent to which we, should we or should we not be taking into account that latest future development strategy. And it's likely that we'll ask for legal submissions closer to the time. Hmm. But, uh, well, it's unfortunate because that means that the submitters don't have the opportunity to um, well, to then to, um, to to deal with issues in relation to what might or might not be in that well, plan. Not, so not all. Ms. Jep will be invited as legal counsel for Save the Might I too. But in, but in terms of the in terms of the submissions process, um, the submissions that were that have been made before this body might have been um, might have been entirely different um, had we have known what the uh, I guess what the was going to be in that particular FDS policy. So you well, it could have we, changed we, the fo could have changed the focus. Can't stop but, time, Mr Stallard. I mean I realise that. <clears throat> All right. The RMA considerations I've um, I've addressed fairly extensively um, extensively in the um, in the in the submissions, and um, specifically the RMA considerations I've, I've addressed the uh, considerations of five 
uh, five, six, and seven in relation to those. Um, I'm, I'm essentially saying um, mm. you're being asked to take a lot of risks to approve this particular plan, and there's no certainty in relation to what outcome is um, is likely to be in relation to it. And those, those those risk factors, I think, have been well and truly highlighted by a number of. Um, people in relation to it. For instance, for once, intensive dairying, intensive dairying seemed to be quite a good idea. Um, so that's, uh, I think there might be a slightly different perspective in relation to that. Um, not so long ago, an, a, an extensive um, plan change was, um, was put before the Marlborough District Council in relation to salmon. And that seemed like a great idea when that was done at the time. Now it's, uh, it's nothing short of an unmitigated disaster and has to keep on coming back because they have to review where they're at. So what I'm simply saying here, there needs to be an exercise of considerable care because we don't get a second chance at this. You muck this up and you bugger this up and you don't get a second chance in relation to it. So I think that really... Um, I think it brings you to a um, brings you to a to another to another matter in terms of um, how you in fact address the um, if you did approve the application what you simply do do you do do you take a trust me approach or don't you take a trust me approach and so um, what I'd simply say is you need to be as prescriptive as you can if you're going to approve this plan in relation to the way in which things are going to be done. Um, because you, firstly you can't assume that it's going to be the same developers that are going to be doing the development resource. Um, basically the, the land that runs with the land, what they can do in relation to that, that's just basically a trite position. So um, while we might trust um, these people that are here with this application, you can't guarantee who on earth is going to be doing the development there. We don't know the, um, the composition or how the council is going to be operating at that particular stage. So I simply say that the risks are too great to take a, um, a hands-off approach in relation to the way in which this matter is, um, is being developed. So. I'm just going to finally address, um, upon the basis that you're going to read the submission, I'm going to finally address the role of the Nelson City Council in relation to this. And um, it was highlighted by one of the former submitters that I saw that ultimately it was a... Um, um, Nelson City Council have actively promoted this um, plan. Um, it's, um, it's been regarded part the way through as a, um, as a partnership between the Nelson City Council and the... Um, and the developers, and when they, you've had some reference from um, Jaquetta Hay when she gave her evidence, and um, she suggested um, in her submission to you that it was regarded as a partnership. And um, Mr. Foley, who I understand has given evidence before here today, is uh, from Tonkin and Taylor. Um, he also looks after EQC. He also is a consultant to the Nelson City Council in that capacity. Um, he has um, prepared reports to Crown for Infrastructure Partners um, in a draft form that's uh, available under the Local Government Official Information Act. This project involves a partnership between the Nelson City Council, private land developers, to upgrade and build resilience to Nelson City Council's infrastructure and enable progressive development of 800 residential lots adjacent to Nelson CBD. So I'm cautious about the involvement of Nelson City Council in relation to this, where submissions are made um, to government agencies in relation to what's likely to happen. And um, simply put it as why I ask you to take care in relation to how you develop this, because there is little confidence that the Nelson City Council will do what it's meant to do. So it falls upon you as commissioners to actually um, take, the, take the ball to, to do it um, if, you, if you decide to, to grant the application, because the Nelson City Council simply can't be trusted to do their I, I job do need, um, properly. I do need to make a very clear statement to you um, right now that we will make our recommendation to the Council on the evidence before us. In relation to Mr Foley directly, Mr Foley provided expert evidence for the applicant. He signed up to the Environment Code of Conduct, which yes, is a special that. obligation. So as far as we're concerned, he is a independent witness and we've treated him like that. Yes, well, he's not subject to... Unfortunately, the process that we're in, he's not subject to cross-examination. Not, so, uh, not, not in this part of the process, not in no. This process, no you're thank right. you. So, so um, uh, it's uh, perhaps for another day. Um, anyway, I have, yes. um, I have said what I, I, I need to say. It's, um, you have a difficult task, and, um, and um, I've watched what you're doing. I appreciate what you're doing, and it's not easy. Thank, thank you, you very much for that. Thank um, you. I just, I'll come back and might have a, a couple of questions, but... 
Um, maybe it might be more statement. I have read, I mean, I, I've certainly read your evidence, your, your submission statement, and it's very comprehensive. And I think what you have addressed is probably reflective of what we've heard from um, many of the other, mm -hmm. other submitters. So um, I have read it, and I do understand it. Um, and again, I suppose all I do want to reiterate is I do under, we do understand the concern that's been raised by submitters. Um, but I'm, hopefully I've been very clear that the council has appointed the four of us as independent commissioners. We are not linked to the council. Um, I have no obligation to the, we have no obligation to the council and we will be making our decision based on the evidence and information that we hear in this hearing. Um, and I think I made that clear in mm -hmm. the opening. Um, so I'm hoping that everyone has confidence, at least in this process, um, that we will take on board all the information and all the evidence and our recommendation will be based on that. Yes, I understand that. Great. So thank you very thank much you. for your submission. Very much. Thank you, everybody. <coughs> um, so those are all of the submissions that would be heard today. So on that basis, we'll adjourn now until 9 a.m. tomorrow. And I think Ms. McShay will put out an updated uh, schedule of submissions, but I think we're not going all day. I think we, we I think the submissions um, a bit earlier. And so, and I will, I'll be checking in with the council officers where they are. So, um, so we've got some submissions tomorrow and then Thursday I think will be the council officers. Thank you everybody, we're adjourned till 9 a.m. Thanks, Tony.